afternoon, good afternoon, and welcome to this afternoon's Sunset Safari, where the water is still flowing here on Juma Private Game Reserve, where we are coming to you live. A beautiful jackalberry tree perched here along the drainage system. The sun is shining, there's a spattering of clouds, but it is a beautiful afternoon to be out and about. Hello everybody, how are you doing? My name is Steve, I'm joined by Olaf on camera and as always we are very excited and yes of course delighted to have you with us on board this afternoon's Sunset Safari and as always uh, we have the ability to ask many many questions and many many comments so if you are watching on our app or on the website please remember you are able to register there and you can ask as many questions and comments as you like however if you are watching on YouTube please go ahead and subscribe so we can keep you up to date with any new content going forward. And on that note as well, Wild Earth is not yet profitable fully, so there is a donation button on the website that you're most welcome to go and find and do your thing. We were most appreciative. So this afternoon, Sabre will be joining me on a solo this afternoon with James watching. He won't be with her this afternoon, so we'll spare some um, some compassion for her as she goes out there with BK to find her way around Juma. Rexon and Owen will be out in Pryland, Cedric and Igor in Madikwe and Ralph and Bo and Makala Lisa will be joining on the, the cameras. So Donna Ferguson and Natalie Carber, thank you so much already for your donations. They are greatly, greatly appreciated. Okay, so we are going to now that we've been enjoying a moment here by the stream where the water is flowing, we are going to just drive up the corner here to where Tlalamba had a kill this morning. Have a scratch around. How does that sound, um, Olaf? Sounds good to me. Sounds good. Shall we go see if we can find Tlalamba, everybody? Let's try. Sky Doogie, you are ready for some spots to come out today. Well, let's go see what we can find. She's not far away. Well, the kill isn't far away. I have a small suspicion she won't have come back. But then, I mean, it's been a, a, quite a warm day. She had come back again yesterday and fed. But then we did wait a very long time yesterday afternoon for her to materialize. Ah, some road maintenance is taking place. How splendid. So the sun is shining here. Let's go and have a look at what the weather looks like across all properties. everybody welcome back to our Juma afternoon safari my name is Sabre and on camera we've got BK we don't have any particular plans for this afternoon except to try to check some boundaries and see if we've got any animal activity coming over perhaps for a big herd of buffalo or some other nice surprises for the moment, we're just enjoying the sun. Soon our summer is going to be over, so we have to remind ourselves to enjoy these sunny days while we have them. Jacob, as are we. It's great to have a sunny day again. We had so many days of uh, quite unusual weather for this area with it being quite overcast and rainy. And although we love the rain, we uh, miss the sun very quickly when it's not around. So I'm very grateful for this beautiful sunny day. And hopefully that means we're gonna find some animals 
nice and active around water sources. Maybe some elephants enjoying a mud bath. We'll see what this afternoon has in store for us. The grass is so long, but uh, we're going to carry on, see what we can find. And we're going to send you guys over to Pridelands to start your afternoon there. Good afternoon, good afternoon everyone. Thanks for joining us here at Pradland Echo Training Safari Live. Very beautiful afternoon. Weather look like a little bit overcast but there's a lot more breeze out here. We are here at Zebra Clearing. It's really looking great. From a south direction this afternoon and we have Owen behind the camera. We are looking for the great afternoon as the weather is perfect here. It's really promising this afternoon. We're not going to have a big shower or thunder. Maybe one time it was on. They got the zebra and the impala in the open. What's more exciting now, the number of zebra are, are really multiplying. They're adding more and more. In a daily basis, there's new zebra adding into this um, dozen of zebra. Of course, some of them are more to the left of the road. It's at the moment a little bit difficult to count all of them then we can see how many are them in totality but yes also the number of zebra look like it's added such amazing zebra and wildebeest look like they travel together all the time uh, moving from one part to another as we know that these species all of them are home range species they're seeking for the best ground where they can get the best uh, grass that they can feed and really love it an area of course where it's nice and it's got water they're moving in the area this is a little bit high ground of course here at Pradland we are situated west of echo training camp itself which is a lot more safe when it comes to ground the ground is not that much uh, really wet they can able to run fast if anything gets into the area remember the environment at the moment in most cases Due to the rainfall seep plant, they're still seeping grass, it do get wet. And all species that have hooves, they're not easy to defend themselves on those terrains because they get a little bit of soft ground and that slows the speed of the impala, zebra, giraffe when it can to defend themselves. As we all know that uh, these species, they defend themselves by running fast away from predators unbelievable it's nice to see the all of them they just stopped because they knew there's two or five zebras as i can count now there were two in the earlier on they now look like a mountain yes of course it's very green we had um late rain this year i think it's still more raining also this part of the morning maybe in the afternoon you never know as time goes on uh, we might still have rain it will stay green until late in, in in winter which is looking great and beautiful of course that uh, it will bring more zebra in into the locations and buffalo lions that might come in we have seen tracks yesterday unfortunately we track it it had a tower east of hq hq is situated into the eastern part of our conservancy of course with the boundary with the Mijajan cutlands when they cross there they're going into our neighboring reserve we cannot follow up but that is promising we were so close i believe that maybe this afternoon there might be we coming in into the property and of course we had giraffe in my area i can't see where i am at the moment female giraffe that is really moving together with the zebra due to the uh, eyesight of course because they have advantage to see a little bit far than the zebra of course and the wildebeest which are coming to our left a little bit pecking down the oh more giraffe coming amazing unbelievable they can really benefit a lot from giraffes to see danger this is the area that likes most by the uh, wild dogs our wild dogs like to come 
all the time around in the area even Gati Prat if they're down here and of course from the beautiful zebra and the zebra and the wallabies the giraffe as they're coming let's take this opportunity across to Madikwe to Cedric Yeah, well, we are at uh, Madikwe at uh, Chukudu Dam, and uh, so far there's nothing so far for any animals coming down here. But it's so beautiful just taking a look at this nest in this dead tree. Absolutely stunning, and uh, it's amazing how these uh, red-billed buffalo weavers actually do create these nests in the middle of the dam in these trees and that. But it's very clever, very very clever, because you can imagine. Things like snakes and that cannot get to that uh, nest at all. So it is definitely one of the ways to protect their young and of course their eggs as well. So yes, but it is not the hotter or the warmest days at uh, Madikwe at the moment. As you can see, it is a little bit cloudy, and but there's hardly any breeze. So I can't wait for this afternoon's uh, sunset safari. I think this afternoon my story will be going north. What do you think, um? Yeah, I think uh, going north, I'm going to go take a look exactly what's happening up that side. And maybe we are fortunate enough to finding some cats or dogs, or you never know. Maybe even hyenas, or a brown hyena. That would be fantastic. <laughs> Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Cedric Dold. And behind the camera with me this afternoon, we've got, once again, Igor. So, yes, thank you so much for joining us. And uh, I'm enjoying this moment. I'm enjoying Chukudu Dam. I think Chukudu Dam is just so beautiful. It is a stunning dam, it's big, and there's always, there's so many elephants that do come down to these watering holes during this time of the day. But as I say, maybe because it's not as hot as the other days, we haven't seen any elephants at this dam, specific dam yet. But the main thing is, I think, maybe, maybe we go a little bit north and go and take a look at the other pans around this area. But yes, of course, uh, there's some uh, European bee eaters are here in the background as well, busy calling. And uh, and of course, typical blacksmith lapwing. Blacksmith lapwings are also around this area, but it's difficult to see them because it's so big, this dam. So to really pick up on where they are and where they're situated, hmm, but you never know. I'll just take a look very carefully. But how stunning is that? Well, there's some swallows. Oh, thanks. <laughs> I'm just enjoying the like scenery at the moment, and uh, eagles got framed up the swallows here. But there's some swallows. It looks like barn swallows once again. Yeah, it looks like barn swallows. So that is a very, very common swallow that we do have around here at uh, Madikwe. Uh, I think it was yesterday afternoon. We got thousands of them on one of the trees, and it was incredible. It looks like little, uh, how can I say, uh, tree ornaments, almost like the Christmas day when you got all those little uh, balls and stars and bells and everything on a tree. As swallows definitely made a beautiful scene to that. But you can see how they're just diving into the water, grabbing some water, drinking. Because these barn swallows, they don't sit really on the ground and drink like other birds. So most of the swallows will just like swoop down and grab a little bit of water now and again. Most of the time, it seems like they sometimes they're a little bit unsuccessful. Like they swoop down, but they miss the water completely. There we go. That one just uh, was quite successful. There we go. So yeah, I think they have to just time it just right. I think if they go too low, they don't want to be kind of bogged down in the water source, which wouldn't be a clever idea for them. Ooh. Wild Earth's mission is an expensive one, but we know that our live experience is important to so many people that cannot afford to pay for it. We have added a donate button to our website. By donating, you are directly helping us share our free nature experiences with the world. We want Wild Earth to reach children, budding conservationists, and the less fortunate. A little money goes a long way. You 
can make a difference to someone today. Thank you for joining us. We are really witnessing a rut in season, the beginning of the season. The impala here, it looked like they started the rut. It's unbelievable. One male was chasing one female particular for a long distance, about 400 meters in a circle. What is that? It's really awesome to see this. It means that uh, the female, they're now going to mate and after mating, they're going to conceive. At least some of them, they stay up to uh, six months after six months they're going to um, deliver well so most of the time you find that uh, the early pickers they might deliver before november early before but uh, normally you find that the run november the first rain of the season uh, within two weeks when the new shoot takes place you find that the impala they start to drop the youngster unbelievable to see that because they're dropping numbers because they know that lots of species that uh, really hunt them sometimes they always follow the impala so if they get up to 20 40 babies 5 10 get to 100 20 is going to survive that's reason the safety in numbers all the time it's super to see that and the zebra all of them look like they are like relaxing wind is starting to break out here it could be a very good thing for them of course maybe it might tell us wind with the rain that comes or it could be a change of weather is going to be a little bit more chill it was a little bit hot uh, in late afternoon right at frontland echo training but now it tend to be everyone enjoying its own company i mean trying to help one another taking off the flies on their face and being open this is beautiful life for everybody they don't have to go under the big trees to seek shadow they can enjoy the life in an open clearing as it is if you look at the impala they're all doing the same in an open melee center of this impala play on this plane enjoying their own life Janet, do you ever zebra co uh, experience a conflict with other species? I haven't seen that. I would never say that it never happened. It can do. It can happen, more especially you find that uh, different season of the year when the grass water gets scarce, they can really uh, get conflict. Their conflict that might be talking about is when the challenge with the wildebeest zebra, maybe kudu and all that. But all the time, you know that uh, the uh, lion hunt zebra. 
that is the um, conflict that I know because uh, it sometimes a zebra will fight back to the lion using the canines but those two is source of life balance of nature but them interacting with other species with the herbivores is very very slim because all of them they really like one another for their own company unless if it could be something created in nature that the spark and able to fight maybe it can I haven't seen that I haven't experienced that but uh, if I don't have experience it doesn't mean that doesn't happen it, it can happen you know out in nature it's a lucky of draw sometimes you might come across with something that you never never witnessed by majority of the people that loves the bush that's the reason they called game viewing or game drive because you're always gambling you never know what's going to come across you never know what you're going to see that's the reason all the time you have to go out whether you win or lose some days of course we win some days we lose but what we do we keep on tapping keep on going checking you never know what's a good lucky day to see the best as we are sitting right here you might find that a cheetah comes in a wild dogs come in and uh, do something or proud of lions so that's reason all the time it's so unique to go out and check what might be in the area because you never know what's gonna see oh look at that it's Tomorrow, yes, very peaceful. You can tell that even themselves, the scent, they don't get any explosive scent of danger. They're peaceful. Oh, look at that female giraffe. This is one of the species, uh, of course, they have a longest tongue, up to 30 centimeters long. They use that tongue, also brushing themselves, getting rid of ticks, extending the neck or, or tongue in order to reach the top leaves of the trees such amazing look how they look if you can zoom in there look at the beautiful eyelashes that they have unbelievable this is a magic it's the most beautiful species if you look at the through the eyelashes from the face i love amy would like to know if they have a preference for the type of dung or flavor that they prefer um, yes, they do actually. It really depends upon the type of dung beetle that you're dealing with. There are tiny, tiny little species that actually quite like the small piles of impala dung, for example. It's much more manageable for the little feet, the little legs, as they create the dung balls. As for our golden orb web, it's also absorbing some of the sun and basking. And you can actually see when you look at the web that there's the space every, every so often between the different strands of silk. And uh, that's called um, like a parchment pattern or a script pattern. Welcome back everyone. Apologies for those technical difficulties. It is sometimes difficult broadcasting from these wild wilderness locations but you're back with us here at the marula tree that is providing us with wonderful shade here it is a balmy warm afternoon i think i forgot to even mention what the temperature is today let me double check it is hot with a capital h apparently it's only 28 degrees celsius 82 degrees fahrenheit which i think is not right but it is what it is. It is warm, but the wind is being very nice and gentle. And the shade is important. Now, we do find ourselves in the savanna biome, easily identified by the fact that there are trees as well as grasses. And the temperatures can get very hot here. And without the shade in the summer months, a lot of these animals would really, really struggle. So would we. Winter months are much more tolerable, but summer months without the shade, animal movement, animal bodily processes would need some proper, proper adaptation. How's up in Pendikwe? It's incredibly hot up there. 
comparison to here. I couldn't believe it. It was tricky sometimes to find a nice shady tree to park under. You don't find such difficulties here at Druma, although some of them do get damaged, like that one. Teresa, the most common tree is probably the red bush willow and uh, they are all around us over here. I will point one out to you. That one. <laughs> this one here. It is uh, probably the most common. Uh, the red bush willow, the large fruited bush willow are abundant down in these uh, in the ridges on the slopes across Juma. The silver cluster leaf is quite abundant. The marulas look abundant but they're very pronounced so they actually stand out more rather than being many. And it is a wonderful week for delving into the medicine of trees and well the red bush willow Combretum apiculatum Where do we get our medicine from? Where did we learn about medicine and plants? We definitely followed animals and then we had elders who tried it once and passed down information. The leaf has been very well used in making a tea to soothe and heal or alleviate any abdominal pain. And also you can steam it um, and sort of steam it for the eyes to assist in conjunctivitis. The fruits are well eaten by a number of our parrot species. We only really get the brown-headed parrot here. And our large browsers will feed on the leaves quite readily, although they are pretty unpalatable to me. I don't really like them. It makes a very heavy wood. Probably the, the favorite wood or firewood around here and has been used by people for making furniture. The red bush willow. We do find ourselves in the bush willow woodlands. Characteristically tall marula trees that stand out on the landscape. A very common sort of vegetation type here in the granitic soils of the southern and western Sabi Sands and Kruger. And here is a a variable or a large fruited. It's sometimes difficult to tell without the fruit, but another bush willow nonetheless. We're looking at a little red billed hornbill on the road over there, hopping along. And there's also a fork-tailed drongo there with it. So a small little bird party going on. There was also another hornbill there. I don't know if they've found a nice nest of ants there or something that's got the few different species together, but they're clearly eating something on the road over there. Both fairly common species that we see around here, but uh, both quite fascinating species. Forktail drongo, the black one in particular. Incredible mimickers. They can mimic about 40 different calls. Mason and the hornbills do have an interesting little hopping walk. It does make their, their tracks also very interesting in the soil. Quite hard to see them, but if it's some soft enough sand, you can. They always look like they're up to something. Probably is some ants that they're busy feeding on over there. The drone goes, oh, there he comes back again. Caught something midair. Back to the safety of a branch.
lovely peaceful afternoon watching birds. I think they're enjoying the sunny day as well. Lovely joining us. We are happy here with the impala. The way they're doing the uh, writing is unbelievable. This kind of rituals is really magic. The sounds that comes out, it's phenomenal. Very, very intimidating. Especially if you don't know what's going on. In the middle of the night, suddenly they do this calling not far from where you might be. If you don't know that it's impala, you might think is a t-rex that might be in the area it's such a very deep voice and carrying a very loud sound look like something is being strangled or somebody's sewing something it's unbelievable they get the beautiful color of giraffe and the light where it moves in the environment itself all these dead trees it makes the painting of all giraffe zebra impala to be more appreciable I really love that. Look at that. Slow motion when they walk. This is one of the species. Of course, they can run fast, but especially in the area where it's less woodland, open spaces to see giraffe running, they can get so fast. Going away from lions or anything that might be really intimidating their life or threatening lives. They can able to move so quick. These animals they're moving from the left to the right. They're always moving around in the same spot. If they feel like they're not comfortable this side, they go to the right of the road where it's been cleared. Or they they all travel at the same time. They started with the zebra, cross over, giraffe follow, impala also follow. And later on here yeah, there was wildebeest. I don't know might be the other side on the tree line lying down at the moment because will be sometimes but especially males likes to roll especially in the wet ground to take a little bit of a scent of a different texture on the smell of the ground the reason behind that because you know that late in the afternoon you tend to see that uh, all the cats get active species like buffalo species like of course wildebeest they tend to bury lots of information in the body system wallowing on the mud that carries a different scent, not exactly as the antelope, which is nice to see that even lions and other species also, they can fool impalas and giraffe, zebra. If they come across with a buffalo dung, they can roll it in a buffalo dung to take that kind of a scent of a buffalo to approach other species. Look at that. That impala is really chasing the female. Is how actually, in most cases, how the impala can know that the male that is involved mating or really likes to uh, mate and spread out the gene is stronger or weak. It has to run like in cycle, but as most of the time, the male impala concentrate on running. In 24 hours, they start to lose condition. He's not gonna mate it with all the female. Of course, in in two weeks, in a period of two weeks, if you keep running like he is running, after mating two to three female, you are exhausted. You cannot able to push again. Lovely. It's nice because we're witnessing all this uh, running of uh, impala. There. It tends to be normal, but we tend to see that in writing season, it takes uh, place quite a lot 
it seems like the more active showing running in a running in a writing season but the same speed that they keep in the writing season and if it's not a writing season is normal we are right in the savage road there sometimes if you take a camera away from the animal we have a lot of vehicles driving past heading hq direction to the east because this is the only access if you want to go directly in that area the game drive vehicle they are really going to check maybe they might find lions for us and able to uh, join our tracks the way we can able to track the lions and it's nice we are perfectly positioned ourselves here any writing that comes it will run in front of us which is the good news here it started look at that <laughs> it looks like to complete the cycle of mating you need to run and exercise your body before even a mating take place it looks like it's the culture of this species because they're always running uh, of course like non-stop they're always chasing one another only one dominant male is doing that but the other male seems like uh, they have no problem with the other male that is doing they're just waiting and now that uh, let let him do whatever he's doing is gonna be the time he start to mate will be finished then i will take over from him it's all the time from the dominant male with the female from the outskirts of the impala on that area there will be male waiting to see if he's gonna be completing the whole mating of all the impala and that's it's impossible to do so you might mate with two three four and the other male take over. If that happens that he made all of them, he is lucky. He might be in an enclosure where there's no competition with the other males. Because in nature, once you tend to be weak, the other males that are in the area, they created so-called the median where they defecate. They can read from the median a pile of dung that has been put down that the male now, hey, is almost halfway, is going to collapse, rather take over. Because in nature, all these species, they likes to carry a healthy gene out there because it's so important for the healthy gene when the youngster get born it will able to move with the mother within a um, short time of the space that's the reason you find that the competition is there that's the reason I believe myself all species that are territorial due to that they have to fight they have to always have the substitute of uh, in your blood that is stronger the weaker one has to go and join the bachelor boys and feed and remain more stronger uh, while we are uh, zebra clearing with these uh, impala moving away let's take this opportunity to Ralph in Amakala to see what is up to Hello and welcome to the Sunset Safari. We're coming to you live from the Amakala Game Reserve in the Eastern Cape province of South Africa. Now, this male isn't playing along with us. We're going to have to turn and get a better view on, me, on him. Anyway, better view on me. My name is Ralph Kirsten and on the camera I've got my main man Mpo. Now, without further ado, I think I just want to check where that other vehicle is behind me. I just want to turn so that we can get a better view on this male. We were with him earlier, and the female, she killed a little baby warthog. And then he came on over, and as male lions do, they steal it from the female. So I just don't want to get stuck here. I'm just going to spin. There we go. That should do. That'll get us a better view on him. It looks like what he's doing right now is trying to find out where that female's gone because, because that is his meal ticket. I think she's probably gotten fed up with him while he was finishing off that warthog and she's walked off and then he's carried on feeding and now he's trying to relocate her. So he's just zigzagging around, I think trying to pick up her scent. And while he's zigzagging around, he's making it a little bit difficult for us to keep an eye on him, but uh, we'll see what happens. He is a beast of an animal. Very, very good looking indeed. Now this is a sunset safari, not only for us at Wild Earth, but all the lovely visitors and guests that are at the different lodges here. So you may see the vehicle 
moving through. See that as he walks, he's sort of slowly just trying to pick up any scent of that female that killed the warthog earlier. Brenda, he is in immaculate condition. It's almost like somebody has uh, been looking after that mane of his. He's just disappeared now behind that thicket, but I'm sure any moment he will pop out. As I say, just moving through, looking for the female. There he is coming across the road now, and he's going to pop out on the other side. So nice for us, though, that he's out in the open, and with this weather that we've got now currently, it is quite cool, and it's making for nice predator activity. Earlier, one of the guides also spotted a caracal that was out in the middle of the day, and as I say, it's uh, quite unusual, uh, except when you have this kind of cool weather that we're experiencing, and there is quite a bit of rain around as well. But look at that. He is in pristine condition. His mane is filling out nicely now, and he's uh, just coming into his prime. Magnificent beast. I think the females are the ones that would tell you otherwise that uh, he's a bit of a leech because all he does is walk around and follow them and they make a kill and he takes it from them and it was uh, uncanny earlier he was just sauntering behind the female she was chasing warthogs eventually got one and he just walked on over and stole it he doesn't seem to do too much more than that little walk he's got going now. Melissa, he is gorgeous indeed. Uh, it's not often you get such a perfect mane such as this. And then, Paul, are you going to be fighting with the pole again? Do you want me just to reposition? Slightly, he's a right, huh? Oh, listen. I thought he was going to start roaring there. He did the beginnings of one. A bit more of a contact call. He's trying to locate the females. And the four cubs are not far from here either. So if we follow this guy, we may land up seeing the whole lot of them love to see those cubbies again. They're down in the river line, that's where they were earlier, and so I think he's our ticket to them. Very, very good sense of smell, and that's what he's trying to do, just to pick up on her scent. Thank you, Wild Earth, for this absolutely fantastic prize at Matea Safari Lodge at Madequa in South Africa. I joined the Wild Earth Explorer program at its onset in 2019 and have absolutely loved every minute I have experienced in the bush with all the characters of Wild Earth, both human and hairy. Thank you again, Wild Earth. Sign up today and you could be the one experiencing it for yourself.
body talking nice and quietly because well someone's sleeping over here we found a rhinoceros with her monocular ears You might notice the ears have got certain markings on them called ear notches so that management can identify them. They do the ear notches when they remove the horn and they can put it in a database with regards to who's who and know what dates and all that sort of stuff so it's important for research purposes it doesn't look too untoward a little bit of a cut in the ear and it's an interesting number of of um, ways that they can be worked different couple of notches there can really add up to a number of different individuals the way they're positioned Becker. They're really whispering sweet nothings into the rhino's ear. Gregory, that's a really good question. Well, they probably get ticks because that's what the oxpecker is looking for, but uh, whether they get wax, I really don't know. It's the strangest thing, isn't it? Earwax. Really is the strangest thing. But is it confined to human beings? I really don't have a clue. If there are any um, rhino ear experts out there, you want to chime in your two cents and let us know where the rhinos do. Let Gregory know if rhinos do indeed have earwax. Please do let me know. Now, rhinos can properly fall asleep like this. I don't know how she's doing so I'm thinking it's a sheep in the sunshine I think maybe the Sun has moved to a degree and she was in the shade at one point Oxpecker has come out with its prize oh let's go to the other one how crazy must that be having a bird inside your ear it's a nice, nice soft skin in there unblemished from the sun. The rhino's skin is quite tough and thick. And the ticks do have the ability to crawl along the body finding the area that is the most comfortable where the skin is at the best. Nice warm areas often around the groin and genitalia area. Katie, Jane, I'm so glad we could find a rhino for you and that it has made your day. I'm sure you are not the only one out there that is feeling that they are blessed to see rhinos today. We don't see them every day and we really do enjoy the fact that we're putting them on camera now. Mm, deep breath there. I mean, it's a really interesting era we're going through and the disappearance of these animals. I remember when I started my guiding career you, know, you all heard that big sigh and when I started my guiding career in 2007 you know I could go on a game drive and see 30-40 rhino easily 
which was kind of commonplace. And now in that area of the Kruger, you won't even find one. It's shocking. It really is. It's sad. And, you know, from an aesthetic point of view, okay, tourists lose seeing them. But from an ecological point of view, the knock-on effects still haven't even been researched. I know for the last five years, there's been universities out of Sweden, Norway, that have been looking into PhDs for the impacts of these mega herbivores loss on the landscape. Because a rhino has got a huge mouth. Huge mouth. And you see this field that she's lying in. It's a massive big lawn. And now herbivores such as the hippo and the rhino mow lawns. They have no possible way of overutilizing the vegetation. Yeah, they scratch a bit and do a bit of damage with their feet every now and again. It's all part and parcel of the territorial behavior. They might damage a tree or two, but it's all the disturbance that's commonplace with these environments. But the mowing down of the lawn to facilitate the feeding for a wide variety of other animals cannot be understated. Cannot be understated. And with the loss of these mega herbivores, how that's going to impact on the environment, how it's going to lead to more frequent or more devastating fires because of the biomass, and how the herbivores are going to struggle to find food within the bulk of grass that is available. Bearing in mind this system has been developed over eons of time with multiple different mammalian species accessing different parts of the landscape. And everybody playing their role. And for a long time, a lot of people haven't really thought about the role the rhino played with regards to what they do and how they mow and open up areas. Very non-selective bulk feeder. Feed enormously. And when I say they can't overutilize, it's because they mow the lawn with their lips and they just chop it down to a nice low level. They can't dig the roots up. So they basically open it up for other animals like wildebeest, the sable, any of the other animals that might need a little bit more shorter grass or allow the grass to regrow. Grass does like to be cut, does like to be chopped to a degree, not too short. But it doesn't like to be left long. When it gets left long, it starts to shade itself. The plant parts lower to the ground lose their photosynthetic potential. And they die, they become moribund. The grass starts to fall on top of itself. Entire swathes of areas can become pretty much dead. So the only thing that will clear that up again would be fire. It's another important driving purpose of the driving force in the landscape. Okay, well, let's go send you over to Sabre. It sounds like she's caught up with a crocodile. Well, guys, quite a peculiar place to find a crocodile. We are not very far from a very large water source and yet in this little quarry we find a massive crocodile. Quite a relaxed crocodile too. We've been with this crocodile for a couple of minutes now and we have watched him go or her go from the sun to the shade. Remember that crocodiles are reptiles so they rely on the outside temperatures, the sun, to control their own body temperatures. So perhaps this crocodile was getting a little bit warm in the sun and had to move off into the shade to drop the body temperature down a little bit. It's all this water after all the recent rains that makes for all these very interesting sightings. Where did this crocodile come from? Haven't a clue. But it's very cool that there is one here for now. As I say, this is this is quite a small water source, so I don't believe this crocodile is going to be able to spend the whole 
winter here probably gonna have to move off but thankfully there is a larger water hole not so far away so he can just go over there or she and it looks to be quite a large one only seeing the head can be quite deceptive at one point we got quite optimistic that perhaps it was going to come out of the water and bask on land so we could get a really good view but alas he just moved into the shade or she they Linda, it's definitely not the first thing I was expecting to see this afternoon is a crocodile. It's quite peculiar. Very exciting though. Um, as I say, did not expect to see one of these this afternoon. And such a big one. Very, very cool. So it's just, just dipped down into the water again. Oh, we're getting a bit of a body over there, a bit of a tail. Thankfully, this water is not very deep, so we are managing to kind of keep track of where it's moving from the dark shade under the water. Crocodiles can hold their breath for hours. So every time this crocodile went underwater, we thought, oh no, maybe it's not going to come back up before we show it to you. This crocodile had BK and I stressing for a moment. Unfortunately, at the moment, crocodiles are having quite a tough time surviving because of the pollution going into our water sources. And also when they lay their eggs, the temperature of the sand that the eggs are laid into determines what sex they are born. So because of the rising temperatures, all of them are being born one sex and they are less of the one than the other. So an unstable population. Peaceful scenes here with our rhinoceros. to just watch the grass dancing around here. And feel the breeze.
as you can see, we're on this big open clearing here on at Medikwe, and we've got a Cory Bustard, the largest flying or the heaviest flying bird. And it is just moving around here at the moment just to see if it can catch any insects around this area. And there is two of them, but I can't see the other one, but there is a male and female that's hanging around this big clearing at the moment. Absolutely stunning. I haven't seen a Cory Bustard for so, so many years. And it's, yeah, well, I saw one on Okukui uh, uh, Dam Cam, but yeah, that's just close. But it's being live with one, no, nah, I haven't seen one for a long time. Are you all right there, Igor? <laughs> the other one is in the grass just somewhere. Oh, there. There it is. Absolutely beautiful. So, yeah, as I said, these things, uh, these coral bastards, when it comes to weight, I mean, you can imagine a, a, fly, a bird that can fly. And it's weighing around about maybe from 6 kilograms right up to 15 kilograms. 15 kilograms. So, that's the size of a... Well, actually, just larger than a, a jackal, a blackback jackal. So it just shows you. Can imagine now with these things flying, and I would love to see one flying. Apparently, if they fly just above you, it sounds like an aeroplane, like you know the wing with the wind coming behind it. Like, shh, and they say it's amazing. So, yeah, absolutely beautiful to see this male and the female monogamous, and uh, this bear is just hunting around down this open clearing. Difficult to say exactly which one's male, which one's female. Uh, oh, that one looks like it went to lie down again. I wonder if it's not lying on something. Because they do nest on the ground. Did you see that? It's like, you know when they bend their legs to go and lie on the eggs in it? It's like something like your ostrich in it. It just seemed like it went to go and lie on something there. All right, maybe there might be a nest there. Just thinking about it now, you know, because it was very strange to just lay down while the other one... To the left, it's just busy hunting not too far off. My craziest sighting when I've had uh, a quarry busters was many, many moons ago where I actually saw, it was a, quite a bit of a sad one for the quarry busted, but I saw two blackback jackals actually attacking a quarry busted and catching one. And it was quite a uh, chaotic uh, scene, and the quarry busted definitely had quite a fight with those two black back jackals, but unfortunately it was overpowered by them. Because it takes quite long for them to take off. You can imagine, as I say, such a big bird. It's not just going to shoot up. It's not like a Franklin or a spur fowl or something like that where they can, they've got that white muscle. Where a quarry busted has to do a little bit of a kind of a running start and then they can take off. So I really have to be quite aware of its surroundings. And that's why I'm mainly sitting on these big open clearings. Clever. I mean, there's no way you're going to find them inside the thick vegetation because how, is, how are they going to, first of all, how are they going to take off? And second of all, you know, there could be danger that's very close to them and they can't see it. So, oh, and they've got some zebras in the background as well, walking on this open clearing. Jessica definitely is it's amazing. It's so, so well camouflaged, uh, Jessica. I think it's what's well, typical, you know. It needs to be, you know. If there is some kind of predators walking past this area, you know, it doesn't want to stick out like a, a sore thumb, you know. It wants to really blend in with its surroundings, having that real browns, whites, and uh, grays to it. So it really kind of pushes into the same coloration as the surrounding areas. So it, it's clever. And that's typical. I mean, like that's a lot of birds have got that. That's where that I can say that camouflage just to kind of hide away and not to be seen too easily, and especially with them. But they've got a beautiful crest as well. But the, it's difficult to see now. Unfortunately, it is busy moving away. You can just see the movement, and well, it can just shows you how long this grass is as well on this big open plains because it's actually the quarry busted. I think it's just the neck and the head that's pretty much appearing above the vegetation. It's got a beautiful long black kind of crest as well. I love it and I've seen uh, videos of it where they actually wear 
where they actually don't know if the males are, but they puff out their necks and almost displaying like that to the females. It's beautiful. All right, well, we're going to sit here a little bit longer and take a look and uh, feed uh, Igor some water. Let's head over to Ralph as he's got a beautiful male line. So, our man zigzagged. He's been trying to sniff out the female that disappeared uh, because of disgust in that she, he had stolen her kill. Um, and he even roared a little while ago, but I think those females are saying, Hi, Bo. Hi, Bo, buddy. You can stick it because he's been stealing their food. So, I don't think they're going to respond to him. I think uh, he might have a little snooze here and then probably get up and still continue on trying to find him. The, the rest of them, I think, have disappeared off down the river line um, with the little ones. So at least he's out in the open that we can view him nice and clearly. And although he's sleeping, he still is a beauty. Oh, those lovely little white lines under their eyes. He honestly looks like... <laughs> Don't lie, Mel. She's saying she doesn't know who between me, Mpo, and the lion, who's the most handsome. I think... Uh, it's definitely him, Paul. <laughs> but he is in tip-top condition. And his hair, I think he must have the best hairdresser around. And he knows it. But, like I say, the females, I think, are fed up with him. <laughs> I'm hoping, if we're lucky, he gives us another roar. Well, maybe not. And that bulge that you can see there is um, from the water warthog that he basically swallowed a bit earlier. Now, they call a warthog here in Isikosa, in the Eastern Cape, a ngakwe. Ngakwe. It's quite a difficult word to say. Can you try and say that? Ngakwe. It's a particular click with the N in front. So N X. Ngakwe. Yes. So the Ngonyama Bambad and Ngakwe. That's how we say a lion hunted a warthog. And a little warthog would be Nchoncho. So the Ngonyama Bambad a Choncho Ngakwe. Yeah. May have got wind of something there. But the wind is blowing from the wrong direction as to where the females are, so I don't think he'll be picking up on them. He may, however, be smelling some prey. That's potential. A gorgeous thief, Sherry. Um, yeah, you're quite right. I think that's probably nailed it on the head. Uh, he is a very good looking thief. Come on, buddy, give us a roll. A little one. Here we go.
Ever seen a lazy roar? No, I think that's probably the definition of one. I think he roared himself upright. <laughs> but that was awesome. There are few things better out here in the bush than the roar of a male lion. And with each roar, I think the females are probably cursing. Drongo, they will burn off calories. So, in the true sense of it, yes, they will lose energy. But it's, it's not something that will um, make them fatigued or anything like that. But it does, obviously. It's like shouting. Uh, it does take a bit of energy to shout, but it's not going to uh, take as much energy as running for half an hour, for instance, uh, or trying to bring an animal down or, you know, or fighting with another male. But definitely there is an, an element of, of energy expenditure. And so he's obviously doing it because he wants location on the females because they are the food machines and it was so pertinent earlier when we followed the two he just sauntered behind the female and she's on move he knows sooner or later she's going to catch something and then he can either you know feed initially if it's a big prey um, or just come in and take the whole lot, which, because it was so small, it was still a snack for him. Um, you know, he can eat a lot more than that. But because it was so small, yeah, she, she basically had it all taken. Um, she tried to sort of sidestep him and run away with it. It was almost like a little rugby match. Um, but uh, eventually he just grabbed it. And she had nowhere to run. Yeah, that's all of your own doing, buddy. But thank you for that roar. That was awesome. So, from one of our amazingly spectacular predators and iconic species, off you go to Cedric with another iconic species. Thanks, Ralph. Yes, look, from Amakala. Yeah, I know that you used to get your secretary birds here. Can you believe it? I've got my secretary bird yet, my dick. Sorry, I got so excited here with the eagle. It's like, I haven't seen a secretary bird for as well for a long time. So I've got the quarry busted. we have got the secretary bird that's moving down the road now. And of course, hunting for any like uh, maybe uh, reptiles, snakes, you know, something like that. So we're just keeping a close eye on it. But unfortunately, I can't move forward because uh, yeah, we might just lose a little bit of signal there. So I think the best we can do is just uh, watch it walk away from us for now. And I'm hoping I can reposition very soon again. But yes, nice to see these secretary birds. Always you can find them on these big open clearings. I think it is amazing when you come to these big places like this and watching birds like this now busy hunting. And I've seen a secretary bird hunt many years ago there at uh, Juma at uh, one of the airstrips called Arethusa Airstrip. And it was amazing. It actually caught a scrub here. Unbelievable, a scrub here. So yes, they are quite ferocious predators. And it is definitely going to be just combing through the area, hoping to find something around here. And I'm hoping that we do get to see a kill. But I will reposition very soon. As I said, but I'm not going to go any, I'm not going to go in that awkward. It is hunting them. You can see it's just looking around. That is so amazing.
Yes, Julie, I'm so happy to share this moment with you, as I'm glad it's your, it's your first secretary bird for Medicwe. Well, it's mine. Well, <laughs> I mean, <laughs> I haven't seen a secretary bird for such a long time, so it is so, so nice to see this. And I'm just, uh, so, so it's a little bit far now. But it's got those beautiful, almost looks like, uh, I don't know if you remember there's those pants that the, he used to wear, the ladies used to wear, they used to call them pedal pushers. Pedal pushers, so it's like half, it's like a half a uh, jean, half a denim. It just goes just below the knees. And it always looks to me like the secretary bird is wearing pedal pushers. All right, well, we're going to try and get a little bit closer than that. Let's head over to Ralph as he's got some lines. It's busy roaring. So our gorgeous thief was just starting to roar again when he wasn't really putting too much into it. I thought he was just going to get going and then he stopped. And well, I'm sure he's going to do it again though because he's irate. He wants to find the girls and he hasn't been able to pick up on their scent. So now he's trying the next method and that's to call them in, but uh, they're not coming. But I'm sure he's going to keep on calling. Look at that yawn. Okay, so is he going to move off? Yep, yes he is. He's going to move off and we're going to follow him. So as we do that, I think uh, you have to go over to Steve. Thanks, Ralph. Our rhino is indeed up. I'm trying to get an identification. I haven't really done any work on the ears yet. But I will remember this one's ears moving forward. skin okay yeah it is it is our beautiful female that had got an injury a while ago she's still looking good it's the only one I've really seen lately thought it was maybe another one but there we go here the feeding starts happening now you can see that that layer of grass in front of her just gets munched. I'm going to be quiet and allow, allow you to listen to the noises. So with the mouth that wide, it's impossible to select. So they just feed on the bulk. And that's okay, a big animal like this can afford to feed on bulk, they just need more of it. We talk all the time about our ruminants. And a rhino falls under the category of a non-ruminant or a hindgut fermenter. So she puts the grass in her mouth, she gives it a little bit of a chew, it goes into a pretty basic stomach. And then out of that basic stomach it goes into a big chamber off of the intestine called the cecum, where a whole lot of gas 
and fermenta well, a whole lot of fermentation takes place and that is actually the place where the hindgut fermenters as the name implies that's where they get most of their benefit from the vegetation that dung or manure is then expelled out of the rhino's bottom very very poorly digested but with enormous amounts of bacteria and microorganisms <laughs> Solomon, you reckon the oxpeckers feel really safe? <laughs> I suppose you you can say that. They're not going to get trampled, possibly. But uh, I think they're feeding mainly on flies that are attracted to her body at the moment. And lots of little insects following her around. Might be some ticks. The red billed ox picker. I wonder how long it takes them to get used to these birds just using them as a, as a place to hang out. I'll poke them and prod them wherever they see fit. Right there in the eye. Jeremiah, well, they're a big animal and they are able to charge. They are able to defend themselves. Um, a rhino that does feel threatened, though, generally lifts its head up, its tail turns up into a sort of a pig like tail, and they trot away. They can often come back again at high speed. Their eyesight is not, or not known to be incredibly good. Their hearing and smell is very good. So sometimes they can actually be quite inquisitive and come closer to investigate what it is that startled them. But they are a relatively easy animal to startle. It doesn't mean they're going to stay away. You know, because, you know, their hearing is so good and their eyesight's not great, they're not certain what it is. So if you happen to be walking and a rhino came towards you and you made a loud noise, they would move off. But if it's a dominant territorial male, he could come back so generally if you have startled rhino on foot they do move off it's a good idea to to reposition yourself somewhere a little bit more safe that's a lovely profile there she's just giving us a full 360 so she has lost a fair bit of condition you can see that in the skin on her ribs there For those of you who don't know, she was caught in a fire the year before last, I believe, but she's still doing all right. I haven't seen her with a calf. I don't know if, if maybe she's been injured too badly. But as you all know, everybody, there is a huge war going on in Africa at the expense of this animal, and so I'd just like to spare a thought and a prayer right now for all of those out there doing the hard work to combat this this battle combat this war it's a very very tough place we find ourselves in and 
also just send out some love and compassion to to the species that um, some of our children or grandchildren might not ever see so let's hope that isn't the case and a wonderful chat the other day with Joe Peterson he's doing lots and lots of work with Rhino and I think the education and the awareness behind it globally is paramount in curbing the disastrous things that are happening at the moment. Can you imagine a world without the magic of nature? Without iconic animals like the Big Five? Well, we can't. For 50 years, we have been dedicated to protecting your future and theirs. Help the Endangered Wildlife Trust to protect forever together. Your small change can make a big difference. SMS now to donate and tune in to Mix FM to win exciting prizes. Oh, look at that. We finally found some large pachyderms and it is just such a beautiful setting. We've got this crystal blue water in the background, green, green grass, hippos in the back, an array of bird life, Egyptian geese, herons, weavers. It's absolutely beautiful, tranquil, peaceful setting. little youngster there still learning how to use its trunk a little bit quite hard to learn how to use that trunk it's got about over 40,000 muscles and it's quite something to learn how to use them all together but in the end they become very dexterous with them after about six months they get better and better with their trunks before that it's a lot of practice and it can look very comical when they're swinging it around not quite sure what to do with it <laughs> this appendage hanging from their face See how different each and individual's tusks are. It's 
Sorry, I didn't I didn't copy Jenna's question. So does it hurt an elephant calf when the tusks are growing? Does it hurt when the tusks are growing? Um it it probably does to an extent. Um they actually have a set of milk tusks, elephants, that they lose after the first year. And the elephants are constantly having um, new sets of teeth coming through. They get about six sets of teeth in their lifetime and the tusks are in fact just modified teeth. So I'm sure much like a baby teething, to some extent it does hurt when their, their tusks are growing. But it's not something that um, is visible to us, visibly painful. It's probably more irritating than um, painful. Alrighty guys, we're going to sit with these elephants for a while and we are going to hand you over to Ralph. Let's see what he's got going on. Well, there's been lots of action here. This male lion, he's been sauntering across the plain, uh, seemingly having picked up scent of the female, but then he spotted three jackals. And he, sorry about that, my radio. And he went bolting after them. Obviously not wanting jackals anywhere in his domain. But they're a little bit too quick for him. And they saw him coming from a long way away. And that's uh, yeah, also probably why he's marking now. Trying to make sure that they've run off and they stay run off. And don't come back, I think is what he's trying to say. But they will. Now he's walking straight towards us, which is what we were trying to achieve by coming around and getting in front of him. We want him walking towards us. There's a spot just near to us here where it sort of drops off and it seems like that one female likes to come here because she gets a bit of a viewpoint over uh, another plain sort of onto the Bushman's River. So I think when he was lying there and suddenly he turned his head, I think he might have picked up the scent of her. So if I'm right, he's going to keep on coming and he's going to show us where this female is. But the jackals sort of got him off the scent, so he's going to have to cut back to where he was walking across from, unless he's getting the scent from where he is now, because that was a bit of a distraction. Well, it's good to see him get a bit of exercise in because uh, up until now all he's been doing is walking up to the females and stealing their food. At least he's got a bit of work in chasing off the jackals. are probably going to have to go past the pole which is uh, holding up our roof saving us from the sun and from the rain a little bit sorry about that but uh, I think it's either the pole or I have to reposition I think the best bet is just to go past the pole Nicole, he definitely has swag. Swagger, he's uh, 
he looks in perfect condition, absolutely perfect. Really well defined, that mane is coming through and look at all those muscles. An absolutely beautiful beast. And the jackals have already made their way back to where he started chasing them from. So that was, uh, as jackals are known for, very cunning. And they just uh, shook him off in the back. So not too scared of lions. But if he can get them, he'll kill them. That's for sure. So he's going to head towards that ridge line. And then from there, we'll drop down and get a view from there, looking up at him. It seems like he spotted something. Maybe not. So, a magnificent thief. I like that one. So, from a magnificent thief to our very wise beasts. These elephants are slowly, slowly moving away from Chitwa Dam, feeding away. I'm quite surprised that none of them are wet. No one's gone for a swim. Not too recently anyway. Oh, she's got an itchy ear, this cow. Very, very thin tusks. No particular reason for that. It would just be a individual characteristic that she has. You can also see her temporal gland secretions. Just now, just before we went live, we could hear some other elephants trumpeting in the distance. So perhaps there was a bit of a herd altercation or another individual that they came across that caused a little bit of anxiety in the herd. But everybody is peacefully feeding once again, enjoying this green grass while they can. The bushes that this female is surrounded by, these round leaf teaks, in areas where you don't have elephants, outside of the Greater Kruger Park, they turn into beautiful big trees. But it's very, very seldom that you find them as big trees in areas where elephants do occur because they're obviously just so tasty and they tend to get more of a bushy appearance in areas where elephants are with multiple stems. Ian, do elephant calves know how to trumpet? They definitely do. They learn from a very young age. In fact, most of the time that we hear elephants, it's actually because of the youngsters. It's youngsters that we can hear. And I'm sure that half of it is innate and, innate and a, another half of it is them learning from their parents. But the, the babies are very vocal and often the sounds that we hear when we here elephants is actually the babies having a little bit of a tantrum because mom won't let them drink any milk and and that's often what we hear and it sounds so aggressive and it sounds like this big nasty elephant but even the little ones make as big as, as big of a noise as the big ones do in fact i'm sure that's quite a bit more of the fun part of having a trunk for a baby elephant so as soon as they learn how to trumpet something they will
is absolutely incredible. I know what's going on. I understand what's going on now. These hyenas are harassing the animals after the rain because they're waiting for one of them to fall down. And they're targeting zebra falls. Look at this. This is absolutely incredible. We're actually having an opportunity to watch these hyenas hunt. And every now and again, one of the stallions fights back and chases them. Listen to the sounds of panic. This is a really, really rare opportunity. We never get to see this. You see the zebra bunching together. The hyenas are, look, look, there it goes again, trying to st stave them off, but the stallion doesn't want to fall too far behind the rest of the group. So the stallion's acting as the protector. Okay, hold on, we're gonna, oh, go! Oh, nearly got a kick in the face there, hold on. Apologies, everybody. I think we had a, a small freeze, a little bit of a glitch in the system there. But we are still here, hanging with the happy elephants. See the hummercorp in the water over there. So lovely when you're around a water source like this because there's just so much life going on. So many different animals. You can see BK's panning on a hummer corp over there at the perfect fishing zone. That's the overflow from the dam and any fish going downstream there will probably not make it. <laughs> or any frogs particularly. Hummer corps love eating frogs. Let's hope this hummer corp doesn't call and fly over us at the same time to give us any bad luck. It's quite a common cultural belief that they can give you very bad luck or death in a family member if they call while they're flying over you. I think we're gonna wrap you guys over to Ralph. Sounds like his male lion has caught up with the ladies. So our main man, the magnificent thief, he has indeed caught up with his lady. He got to the edge of the ridge here and I don't know if he did a little contact call but she came running on over so my theory that she's disgusted with him and doesn't want to see him fell flat because she looked very happy to see him and so now he's got his food machine back I just hope that the next kill she makes is a little bit more substantial than that little baby that she got earlier, the baby piglet warthog, and that she can have something to eat as well. The jackals are also calling now in disgust after having been chased by the male lion. And there's some thunder and lightning around too. So, all the natural sounds. Now that he's found her, he's uh, quite happy to go flat out and fall asleep. She's the one that's going to be looking for the food. But quite a nice little display there, um, sort of through today, with the female having caught food, him 
dominating it, taking it. Um, but then the moment he saw another predator or scavenger, that's when his real use is found. He chased all of them and they went running. But as I say, Jackal's very cunning. Um, they will avoid the lions, but they'll be right back in the mix as soon as he turns his back. But if it was hyenas, or leopards, or cheetah, or anything like that, he probably would have pursued them a lot harder. But jackals, quite nippy little creatures, and uh, they're pretty fast on their feet. They've got quite good acceleration. Um, over long distance, if he had to pursue, he'd probably catch them. And if he was a lot closer when he started the chase as well. But uh, he was quite a way off, and over the plains, they could see him from a distance. So they were almost laughing at him as, they, as he chased after them. But they did motor on, because if he gets anywhere near them, they'll be toast. First few drops of rain. Uh oh. Tessa. I don't know if that's the wild earth tessa or a just a not us I don't mean just but a viewer that's tessa either or doesn't matter it is a family reunion isn't it guinea fowl are long calling now I wonder if they've just picked up sight on these lions Don't get caught in another storm. And these lions, if it does start raining, they pretty much just lie out in it. Depends on how hard it is. Sometimes they can sort of go under a bit of a bush, but uh, they just look miserable. But uh, they just stay in their misery until the rain passes. Sometimes it's not too bad also for hunting purposes. It can uh, deaden their smell and the sound, so make it easier for them to catch the prey. Especially when it's dark and it's raining and everything's in their favor. It doesn't look like there's going to be any hunting happening anytime soon though. They're doing what they do best. Flat cats. the thunder. I think things are going to hot up here a little bit and by saying that I mean that uh, I think the storm is upon us so we may have to get on up and out of the basin here while we uh, try and run from the storm. I think you need to run on over to Steve. Thanks, Ralph. Well, good luck with the rain. Finally, some rain heading down country. We've had enough of it up here, and we'll find ourselves still with our rhinoceros, who I think is quite lonely. I think he's quite lonely. I think she might think we are a, another rhino of some sort. She came very close to us at one point, and then she did a little jog away. And she's just been turning left and right and trying to figure things out. She hasn't had another munch since that first bit of nibbling she did. But so blessed to spend time with these animals. Thank you. 
Excuse me. <clears throat> Momo, are you suggesting I just go and give her a hug? I'll just jump out the car now. Don't know how that would work. Definitely be another oh my word moment. She would. She would really appreciate a good hug. I've had this before with rhinos. They stay with you for a long time. Just moving backwards and forwards, male and female. Just trying to figure out what's going on. Okay, well, shortly we might try and leave our rhinoceros and go check up on Tlalum, but meantime, let's go over to Sabre, who's enjoying some time with Ellie's. We're just watching this, this elephant cow, how she is sticking her head right into that leadwood. Leadwoods don't have thorns, but they are quite spiny. And it's just a reminder as to why those elephants have those beautiful eyelashes that so many people are jealous of, what they have them for. One of the purposes is to protect their eyes when they're sticking their whole head into a shrub like what she's doing right now. You might think, well, how much help can those little eyelashes be? Better that than nothing. I'm sure it helps to quite a large extent against dust as well and they dust bathing or if it's a very windy day but mostly against the bushes when they're sticking their heads right in there to get to the good stuff she's nearly annihilated half this leadwood while we've been sitting with her she's doing some serious landscaping All the herbivores would have those, or well, the browsers in particular, will have nice eyelashes like that, particularly elephants and giraffes. Oh, really getting in there. You can see how amazingly dexterous that trunk is. All those muscles working in unison. They can pick up something as small as a pea with the tip of the trunk. And often they'll use their tusks along with their trunk to break off a branch to get into their mouth. Her trunk seems plenty strong enough at the moment though. She's not using her tusks at all. Elephants do not avoid thorns while they are eating. In fact, they love the trees with thorns, particularly the acacias. Those thorns are there for a reason, and that's because their leaves are so full of nutrients. Some of the acacias have more than 14% protein in each leaf, so those thorns are there to try to protect those very nutrient-rich leaves. What I have found while watching elephants feeding on a very thorny tree is how slowly they do it. So they're very careful, even though they've got this 
lovely thick skin that doesn't get hurt by much. They eat very slowly and meticulously picking in between the thorns and actually do ingest some thorns as well while they're trying to get to the leaves, taking whole branches. But no, they don't avoid the thorns. Interesting to note that ox peckers actually avoid elephants. I have never seen an ox pecker sitting on an elephant. So they've got to get rid of the parasites all by themselves, all those ectoparasites. You can see how busy her tail was there, how busy her ears are. So she's busy swishing away all the biting insects. Even though they got such a thick skin, it's still quite sensitive. So they do feel those biting insects. So they've got to rely a lot more on their tail and their ears, mud and sand, to get rid of the pesky parasites. Harry, I'm so glad you noticed. I am too. The guinea fowl are going crazy on the dam wall. Lovely starling going in the background. I'm trying to remind myself the woodlands are leaving soon, so I have to enjoy every call. And I feel like that call was just for me now. now the, the birds are having a very happy afternoon. I think they're happy that the sun finally came out today. It's cooling down a little bit. So everybody's getting their last says in for the day while it's cooling down. Although those guinea fowl are quite noisy, I don't believe they can see anything for the moment. We've been watching them for a while. I'm trying to pan over to these buffalo weavers over there. Ah, they've just moved off. There are some lovely buffalo weavers, but they've just decided to move off, carrying quite a bit of material in their mouths to go and fix up their nests. Lovely. Uh, we are just uh, witnessing beautiful African spirit bull, which are really no more to you than nothing inside of this uh, water hole. It's magic. We just witnessed that one of it just made a kill. It could be a fish, it could be anything, you know, that fish can be in anywhere around an animal, especially in a big, or oh, I mean, dams like this, because all these African spirit bull, Afri I mean, the Gorgos, I mean the goose, and a lot more species when they really uh, hunt around in the area, they carry lots of eggs of different species of uh, fish and are uh, able to uh, transport from one water hole to another. We have a little bit of a surprise. Oh, it really, it looks like beautiful here. We are, are having the Luxozonta Africana approaching the water. This is uh, the water lovers, I mean, they like swimming, like doing all of what they need to do. We have witnessed them uh, early this morning. They were in the northern side of the dam. Same elephant. There were four of them, young bulls. They might uh, do the same. I mean, they can dip in and start to uh, swim and uh, pushing one another. Let's see if they can allow us or give us that entertainment. Because sometimes you know that the elephant late time of the day like this beautiful oh it's a grey heron you see that uh i went between this v-shape of uh lead hood completely in Barbara straight to the next tree you can see the gray headed bush rock it's really look like it's just finishing on the kill 
of something i never know what you cannot know what might be it could be frog or fish you get him oh lovely there's quite a lot of aquatic species that are taking place this afternoon Lovely. Listen for this. <whistles> One of the most rare species to really see it is called African grey head bush, bush rock. They like to be always in a thicket. In the Africans, they call it spokeful. What that means? It means a ghost bed because it's difficult to spot. You're lucky if you find them, especially in this area. But as it's calling behind us, I don't think it might be in a very thick bushes. It could be one of these uh, acacia trees behind us, which loves by elephant. Acacia aggressant, which means black like me. Knob ponds, it really loves by elephant. Debugged and eat quite a lot by the majority of the breeding hair that are in the area. So specific because the Kamiyam layer, of course, it does host a lot of nutrition. Keep on seeing beautiful soil, beautiful core. Caroline has been an uh, elephant fantastic, fantastic drive for the whole show all this morning since the elephant look like they're coming back in numbers in the area. We know that uh, there is one or two breeding herd of elephant. Actually, it's only one that's split up into two herds that uh, always find in this uh, western part of the, the conservancy here at Pratt and Acre Training Safari Life. One of them, you know, that uh, they have. Uh, funny task is how actually can really identify and able to know it look like uh, they become a little bit resident but it's very rare to find an elephant be become a residential uh, in in the area try not to move in and out but it can happen of course just because of the water and the availability of four uh, grass that are in the area to stay longer maybe they might travel again in a different season of the year find they might go somewhere elsewhere their preference as you know that the elephant is one of the species that have very good memory they know each and every area where they've been and the reason why they spend time here they know the other part where they normally hang around it cannot have at the stage might not have a healthy grass as it's in Pryland because they have that uh, a freedom to move without having a passport. Their freedom of movement from one area to another. They can go to Kruger, they can go to private areas, they can go up to the Ngara Zoo National Park, which is in Zim. The elephant have that uh, migration route all the way down to there. They can cross the border and go in an area where they want. These elephants look like they're enjoying at the moment to be on the top, on top of the dam wall, which is slightly different for us, difficult for us to see the full views of these elephant, but we'll wait and be patient to see if they can give us entertainment of swimming and playing inside water because it looked like oh there's a young one here also coming slightly towards our camera maybe he might come on the outlet of this water where it's more easy for us that we can view a full shot of the elephant such amazing one of the elephant that we spotted here it does have a very beautiful coloring after bath mudding on a saw that takes off the saw that look like whitish in color. You can see from far distances that uh, yes, that color is a little more bright and it's easy to locate. Wow. Come. Elephants are such a cute species. I love watching elephants, especially in numbers. Ori, you're definitely absolutely right. They're very relaxed. You can tell 
if you look at the elephant how actually uh, how can you identify elephant is the flex if you look at the elephant from the front you will see that shoulder muscles from the uh, shoulder uh, uh, bullet that you can see or nuclear muscles you tend to see that from the front you know that uh, it's a lot more relaxed it's going a little bit up nodding head doesn't mean that it's angry nodding head is to uh, indicate that it's a living animal that is moving there uh, look at it. all of them elephant likes to simplify they are across on a table top of the dam wall maybe they will start to dip inside the water from the northern part of the uh, dam itself but it makes our life so much easy and really enjoying In most cases, people they ask question about uh, eyesight of an elephant. Guides, everyone to know, the eyesight of an elephant is good. It's not like uh, as far as the other species because they rely on a sense of smell. They can smell water from 20 kilometer away if it's very drought. If any water that might be in the area, they can even smell from that far distances. You can see they'll lift the trunk higher. And get the direction where the water is and they really shoot towards that direction you know that sometimes in a very dry season here that makes the elephant live particular area or stay in the one area is all about the water source don't go boy the first elephant look like her he's not even interested to come down to water and play he look like he's gonna head stay to the south it's time for the elephant uh, to eat because of course they might have a lot of time playing wherever they might be because the company of the young males all the time what they enjoy the most is to play and have fun and again they will set up their own time where they will move and only feeding From uh, Lover Dam here, Echo Training Safari Life. Let's take uh, this opportunity from Elephant and join the Seba at Chito Chito Dam. I am so happy to see this African Jacana. You guys might have seen it here at Chitwa Dam quite a couple of times, but in some of the areas that I work, the lack of water sources, particularly vegetated water sources, means we don't see a lot of them. And I just think they are the coolest birds, particularly when they have their babies. And their chicks' feet are like triple the size of their body. It's quite incredible to see. It's, it's quite funny, actually. And this guinea fowl is just begging for our attention. I think we have to give it to him, BK. Yeah. He's just not keeping quiet. Out in the open, look at me. Yes, we are watching you. So much to say. I think he's lost his, his flock. There's a few of them and now there's only one. And hear the others calling off in the distance. <laughs> Betty, are we sticking with the Tuesday theme? It definitely is chatty on this Tuesday, that guinea fowl. Very attention seeking individual. So here we only get the helmeted guinea fowl. But further north we get the crested guinea fowl and they are the most bizarre looking creatures. They've got this crazy afro on the top of their heads. Very cool looking. 
And these helmeted guinea fowl always remind me of dinosaurs with that crazy helmet on the top of their heads. They're actually often kept in captivity. Perhaps some of you watching have had some at your home before, wherever you are in the United States or in the UK. And I believe when they are kept in captivity, they tend to lose quite a bit of their coloration, tend to go more of a white color. Not particularly sure why, maybe they're missing some kind of nutrients, maybe it's because of stress from being in a captive environment. Guinea fowl's listening very carefully now to try and locate the rest of his flock. I think we're going to have to make him push on a bit. Michelle, if guinea fowls could speak, what language? Well, forgetting the fact that we are in South Africa, I for some reason imagine them being Spanish. Spanish or Italian? They're confident. Particularly this one. Right, I think we are going to move on to Chitwe airstrip. Late this morning, someone did sight Langa on the airstrip, but unfortunately, she moved south into a property we cannot go. I think while we are off searching, we're gonna send you guys back to Steve. He's found something quite interesting. Well, thanks, Saber. Good luck on Chitra. Oh, oh, spotty surprise indeed. Hello, my ribs. The Deirdre's cuckoo in the background is saying, Maribs, 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 Maribs. <whistles> it's not really, it's saying, Deirdre, 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 cuckoo. And the flies are bugging him to no ox peckers to assist with the flies and a body that feeds on meat and flesh oh there he is I didn't recognize him before there's a classic Maribs look with those ears now he is half a meter from maybe a meter from the side of the road and if you did not look carefully you would just would not see him. Have a look at this. Hold on to your your position, everybody. Hold on, hold on to it. Can you see him? He's moving, you'd see him, but if he didn't want to be seen, if he was another meter in, no chance. No chance. But it's good news, he's grooming. Well, we always like finding leopards, don't we, Olaf? Indeed. I'd love to take credit for finding my ribs, but it was actually Peter from Koro who came through. I 
and notified us of him and said he was looking at the Warthog burrow that's behind us a few years ago. If any of you old viewers remember, I had Tingana killing a Warthog live. It was quite a scene. It's the same termite mound where the Warthogs are living that Maribs was looking at, apparently. And the Warthogs all went running out. He didn't even move. Now, those of you wondering, how old is Maribs? He's, he's three. He is a March baby. So he just said his birthday the other day. In aid of International Women's Day on the 8th of March, Wild Earth is hosting Safari Sisters. Join us for a day of female fun in the wild, featuring some of our best female naturalists. I did not think I would ever face my fears like this. Focusing on the incredible role that female animals play in nature. Join us in celebrating the wonderful wild woman of Wild Earth. Well, you haven't missed much, everybody. The ribs turned his head. And now he's gone back to sleep. We're expecting a full moon today. Seventh of March. Joshua, our fluffy prince, indeed. see if I can find somewhere exactly when our full moon is going to be rising.
Let's get into that time of day where Maribs is as excited about the full moon as we are. I'm only joking. The moon, the moon makes things a little bit more difficult for our predators. Just that the other animals can see much better. Elaine, it's hard to say. I mean, the moon affects tides, it affects currents, it affects, definitely affects me. I have no doubt a moon sort of movement in my body, things happen. You know, sometimes you're feeling a bit strange, you don't know, you're like, oh, hang on, ah, it's a full moon. But how it affects other animals, it's hard to say from a sort of um, physiological level, but most certainly when it comes to hunting, uh, predators find it a lot more difficult to hunt because it's so much brighter. Our prey animals are able to see. Uh, I'm not saying they can't hunt in the full moon, but I could see you walking around at night in the full moon. And a pilot can see, a kudu can see. So our leopard and our lion, they struggle to hunt in the full moon. Purely because of visibility thing, but they can still catch animals if they're able to ensnare them in a certain way. But a leopard on its own trying to go to an open area like that we have close to camp, there's no real chance. But the full moon is an hour later tomorrow, and the next day, next day. So that evening gets shorter and shorter again. So just for one evening, we'll find that the illumination of the sun, then with the illumination of the moon, our predators find it a bit difficult, but it's only one day. I think um, Peter's caught up with um, with Salamba, she's gone back to her carcass. Uh, Peter, just confirm you've managed to relocate Salamba there? Yep, she's back at the bumper. Amazing, is she still on the floor? Go, okay. thank you. Okay, so Salamba has made it back. It feels like it's that kind of coolness in the air now. The wind has picked up. Clamber doesn't have to go hunting. She's probably got more than one carcass strewn across the landscape. Maribs, what are you going to do, my, my friend? <laughs> JD, indeed, the lineage of Juma is real, isn't it? Um, Lalamba around the corner, Maribs here. I actually just posted two separate pictures on Instagram, one yesterday, one today. One of Mawati, who's potentially the father, we believe, of, of this young gentleman. And then today of Tingana, who is the father of Lalamba. Two big, impressive, dominant males of the area. And you can see this gentleman here is as dominant as they come, lying on his back, swatting the flies. Dominate them, Maribs. Dominate them. And Lof, let me try and move a little bit further to the right here. I might give you a little bit more of a top-down view. Should we try? Yeah. Okay, I'm just going to go back slightly. And then forward towards this bush. And maybe you'll get a better angle than over my nose. Tell me when you're happy. You got him. Maybe back an inch. There we go. Hello, my ribs. So we were actually doing a loop from our rhino carcass before. Rhino. 
This is called Elephant Carcass, this road. That's where that slip of the tongue came from. We were doing a loop to head back towards Tlalamba. And then Peter found this gentleman lying on the side of the road. I'm not sure where Sabre is at the moment, if she's still on Chitra. I know Peter said that Langa was seen there earlier, so maybe she's enjoying elephants and some birds and maybe scratching around for that beautiful young lady. In the background, woodland kingfisher and the African black cuckoo. He's so sad, you see, that's what he says in his voice. Lion's calling now in the north. It is starting to become a predator filled afternoon. We found a beautiful pair of ground hornbills happily feeding away. You can see how hard they look in the grass while they walk through the grass for any little bits to eat. Tortoises, chameleons, lizards, insects. Massive bull is so so strong. Because typically the one chick kills the other chick in a natural nest. There's been amazing conservation efforts to actually remove one of the chicks from the nest, the weaker one, and it is hand reared but with a puppet so that the chick doesn't know. It's people feeding it, and it actually, that way, it has a better time being released back into the wild. So if it's uh, hand reared by a human, so it's the imprint on the human, and it will lose its fear to humans and become a little bit too familiar. So it's better if it's done with a puppet. And because of this conservation effort and them releasing those ones as they're old enough back into the wild, their population is slowly stabilizing once again, which is great news. Ah, with the elephants in the background, what a view, guys. Lovely. We are with the elephant. They decided to move it quickly behind the thick bushes. They were really pushing one another and we were coming here to witness that. Maybe if we reposition, we may be able to benefit the best view from the area where they're moving. So let's try to, to follow that. Oh, the shaking tree. What's wrong here? Let's witness something here. Look like this young elephant are really showing quite a lot of energy here. Jacqueline, yes of course, I mean there is lot of experience and a lot of uh, uh, sort of research how elephant can see. 
but uh, what I believe that uh, in most cases they see they can look uh, they can see in blue colors they can see in different way but I can believe more special for elephant pieces that uh, are grayish in color like as far as an elephant they don't have any color to show that they can use white color for full mechanism they are I really don't see colors they're color blind they can see that in, in a different dimensions of how they see things uh, and that maybe i can google cut a lot of that but uh, i believe you can rely on the sense of smell and the sense of uh, hearing they move at night they can see not far less than 50 100 meters especially if it's very thick so they cannot run into uh, a ditch of course they can see that there's ditch and able to stop so they can see a little bit uh, better maybe in a color blind black and white color dimension who knows these boys they're really really entertaining unfortunately it looks like uh, they're following one missing bull is older than them maybe he's the one that uh, are leading at the moment and teach them how to behave out in nature so it's it's in the nature of an elephant all the time they'll find an older a bull that uh, always teaches how things works out in nature the similar setting of the matrioc in a breeding herd i love i love this kind of a playing they look like they just touch one another and leave touch one another and leave maybe they'll come back towards the water source at night after they've collected food around in the area i know that an elephant is one of the species are not chamber stomach not for not a ruminant actually for chamber stomach they have to collect quite a lot of food in the course of a day to make themselves happy they have to eat because if they don't properly eat they might start to lose conditions but it's a perfect time of the year with quite a lot of grass uh, leaves bulbs <coughs> Uh, plenty around in the area. Okay, let me try to reposition again. Let's uh take the opportunity back to stiff with the favorable my favorable leopard marids mm, well, welcome back everybody and welcome aboard and if you are only just joining us this afternoon welcome live to Juma private gamers of here in the Sabi sands where we have got the three-year-old Maribs just lying up here next to the road. Not sure what his plans are, but uh, he's starting to get a little bit awake. And uh, as you know, we are live, we're interactive. If you have any questions and comments, please do fee feel free to send them through to us. Hello everybody, my name is Steve, I'm joined by Olaf on camera and we are very excited to have you with us at this sunset time on the full moon in March. Welcome on board. So Maribs is just here on the side of the road having a bit of a chill. Rexon has been spending some time with some general game and some elephants. Ralph has been with a lion in uh, Amakala and Sabre has been moving around and checking out Chitto with some elephants that side. We also spent some time with the rhino not so long ago, which was quite wonderful.
vicinity. Probably my most memorable sighting with him. I haven't actually spent a lot of time with him. I've had some really amazing sightings with him and Tundi. Um, lots of beautiful little intimate moments when Tundi was stood around. But something that will stay with me is when September, I think it was September last year, I found Shadulu, a female leopard from the west up a tree close to our camp. Um, that same, or the next day, Tlalamba came and Shadulu and Tlalamba had a bit of an altercation. And then the next day, this gentleman came and we found Shadulu at the top of a of a Albizia tree and this fly snapping gentleman growling at her not knowing sorry if he's gone behind the car of course we've positioned ourselves in a way that he's gone behind us we shall turn and uh, if we lose him that is is he is walking and so he was standing there holding onto this kill and just growling at her the whole time while uh, Shadulu was perched at the top, top, topmost branch of this tree. Not very happy with life, not very happy with him either. Let me just do one more little spin. That's much better view, my lips. Much better view. There we go. And so that was a very, very memorable sighting of this young gentleman. I've had quite a few moments with him and Tandy and Tortured that we just didn't have signal, so we had to leave. We weren't able to spend enough time. We weren't able to go live. But I've no doubt if we did have signal and we were able to go live, we would have had some wonderful interactions between them. She was just such a, a feisty female, Tundi, and she would snarl and growl, and it didn't seem to bother him at all. It didn't seem to bother him at all. He just, he'd probably think, oh, mum's having one of those days. A Tundi day. So Mel, if you want to talk to Sabre and let her know she's welcome to go to Tlalamba. I know she's still quite far out. So I believe Tlalamba is not far from here. She's, well I do know, well, I believe, I know where she is. So Sabre was still on Chitta, but if she makes her way back, We'll spend some time with this young man and see what he gets up to. Oyster Catcher, when is he going to leave his natal area? It's a good question. You know, I mean, Hosanna, at the age of three, three and a half, started going on his little walkabouts. And then he did that once and then he came back and we were all happy. Went and sort of found an area further south that seemed to be quite suitable for him. It seemed to be the sort of place he felt like he could put down some roots and an altercation down there I believe with the Anderson male and um, he came back with a few more scars and maybe a little a few more life lessons spent some time here again and realized he'd outgrown this place and then he left establishing a territory some kilometers south from where we are so I'd say within the next year probably earlier than a year itself but I think it's quite dependent on the individual. Lauren had wonderful scenes with him week before last. We'd found him in the morning. So wonderful scenes with him and Mawati in the tree and not too much negative behavior between the two, father and son. But soon he's gonna start getting big, start showing some more brawn, start his behavior is going to start changing and well dad's not going to like that dad's going to push back very hard and suddenly you find yourself becoming a testosterone filled young male not really knowing what to do with yourself in the territory of other males and they will react very negatively towards you he is tolerated here because he is the son and he does provide meals that dad can capitalize on from time to time 
but as soon as he starts showing that sexual maturity, he'll be ousted. Who are you? I mean, uh, he's got a bit of a, oh, I can't really tell you if he looks anything like Tandy. I don't think so. It's very hard to. <laughs> he's got a little bit, maybe a little bit in the eyes, but I'd have to look at some pictures together. I've taken some wonderful pictures of him recently that I'm going to be editing. And then that's, that's I think, when you really get the, get the view. It's probably one of the reasons Tristan's got such an eye for for his cats the side he's taken a lot of photos and he spots them immediately takes me a moment I haven't spent as much time behind the lens I don't know if I'm gonna just pull up a little bit over here just a little bit Now I feel a little bit more intimate with you, young sir. Virtual's kukul calling in the background. Also known as the rain bird. I don't know who he gets the tongue from. But I remember I was on Pridelands walking, a bushwalk, when Tristan was with Maribs on, I think he was in Chitra, and he silly, crazily went for a puff at her and bit him on the foot. And that definitely got everybody in a bit of an uproar. You expect a snake like that to to kill a leopard, but it seemed like he got a big fat paw for a little while and he was none the worse. Incredible. Maybe he learned it. I don't know, even listening to Tristan's commentary, it didn't seem like Maribs was in an enormous amount of pain. Well, they say a puff had a bite is incredibly painful. Probably, though, a meal he'll think twice about next time. <laughs> oh, Tina, the, you feel like the tongue is what makes him my ribs. Was the tongue there before he got bitten by the puff adder? There was a whole year I didn't spend here, really. I didn't get to see much of him. He went from being a little cub that we found on Chitra to suddenly being this boisterous youngster. Oh, lion calling. That sounded like a contact call initially, but I had my earpiece in. You can hear now that it is roaring. Happy days. Maribs, what are your plans? Are you got any plans for this this full moon? That's coming up. full moon that is was actually full at uh, 20 to 3 South African time today uh, it's been named the worm moon by Native American tribes in the 18th century Ooh, that's a nice yawn 
in reference to different creatures that emerged from their winter hideouts to welcome spring. Obviously this is a North American story. The March moon will, oh, that will reach, will reach its peak illumination at 7.42 a.m. Eastern Standard Time on Tuesday, that was this morning, or early in the morning for those of you just tuning in to the 7th of March. Calling all Wild Earth Explorers. We have a brand new prize for you to win. The lucky winner will jet off to the magnificent Amakala for an incredible three night stay for two at the Shossi Game Lodge. Unwind surrounded by the natural music of the wild and enjoy daily safaris from an open vehicle. Sign up to be an explorer and you could be heading off to this unforgettable safari destination. Welcome back. It really is, he's on the move. He's on the move. He's got a bit of a swagger and I, I feel for him. He's flies. Look at the beautiful Marib's track. Marib's Fresh male epitraxity in this direction. Okay, it's always interesting following him on the road, but we, you know, that's why we track the way we do. They love to follow the tracks like this. <laughs> Fierce with your flies, they are quite irritating. I'm just going to get on top of this little bump, and we'll switch off for a moment. the bump and around the corner he goes so 
So, we're sort of heading in the direction of Treehouse Dam. Sort of the central part. It's an area Hosanna used to hang out in, so he's kind of just filled that that sort of space that the little chief Hosanna who was just like Maribs. Although we probably found him. Oh, the scent marking. Now this is the kind of behavior that's gonna get him into trouble. Now he did a bit of a scratch. Now he's either urinating or having a poo. We'll have to see. It's the kind of behavior that'll get him into trouble. You can hear the birds alarm calling. Rattling cesticular for the most part. Oh, is that grey headed bush shrike calling? Oh, he's going to scent mark. This is what his dad will give him a hiding for. So, the time of him needing to leave might be sooner than we think. Venus. The scent mark of a leopard can last about two weeks without rainfall. Plus minus. Okay, let's go, Olaf. Plus minus. Some dwarf mongoose also shouting in the thickets there. Let's smell. Is it a poo or a wee? I couldn't tell. But um, scent marking, scent marking. So. Male leopards, male lions, rhinos will remark their territory regularly with rain. And Mawati probably hasn't been able to walk around these areas properly yet in the last couple of weeks. Although he did walk this route last week, but then we had more rain. So it's a busy affair. Oh, the smell. The cheese Doritos popcorn smell the leopard scent mark wafted into our noses there okay, so he's coming to a junction where he could go straight or we could go right or we could go left or we could just have a drink right there in the middle of the road great place to have a drink What do you think, Olaf? He's going to go straight? He's going to go right? I don't think he'll go left. Oh, maybe right. You think right. Maybe he's going to my lumbar skills. Maybe. Left, right. Right, left. He might. If he turns right, he'll make his way towards where Tlalumba is. If he goes straight, there's still an opportunity to go right, right, which will then get him towards where Tlalamba is. The wind has completely dropped. So how he got here from where he was, he probably followed the Mawati drainage system. And there he goes again after a nice little refreshing drink out of that muddy stream. Delicious. I mean, it's, it's a puddle of mud that a vehicle track has been in, and lovely. They're not stirring at all with it. Oh, watch out, it's a bit of a, a bit of a track, this one. They're not that discerning with it, so they'll drink it muddy, algae full, to consent. Doesn't want to step in it though, but he doesn't mind drinking it. Scent marking again. These magic quarries serve as such a good scent mark post. It's growing close to the road like that. They've got lots of foliage. They're low and bushy. You'll see our cats rubbing their faces in it, spraying their urine, secreting all of their flavor on the plant and anyone who walks past can't miss it that 
it's a very obvious indicator. Ah, right he goes. <laughs> that was almost like he didn't even think that he knew exactly where he was going to go. And now we found Mawati, the ghost, last week, pretty much here, walking towards us this way. So now Maribs is definitely here, right where Maribs is now, is where we originally found Mawati just the other day. Larry joining us from Maritz. We are still with the elephant here. Looking great. These bulls look like they are enjoying themselves now. It's time for them to graze. No longer pushing one another. It looks like they are going to be really spending their, most of their time in the area. You know that the elephant, they are also continuous eating at night. They will never ever stop, of course. I believe that uh, they might head north and come back. This is look like the area that they prefer. If you look at the level of grass, there's no way, there's no doubt that these animals, they cannot move um, in the area. They might be still around here for, <coughs> for a while because of the healthy food that they're collecting. It's, it's a good year for an elephant, of course. We're looking for the fluctuation of populations in the next uh, year or two. Of course, we know that uh, if it's more plenty of food around in the area, it means that uh, it will be also an addition when it comes to populations of all different sorts of species. I'm very glad to see the level of the grass that tells me all oh, the leopard as far as the lumber and the rest that might be in the area where competition is so huge they can able to raise the young star to successful because of course all these trees that push while elephant now has got a lot of cover the young star can also hide easily and uh, grow up to adulthood. Not only leopard lions also, look at the caracal, look at the spotted genet, all these kind of species. They really love, they will be loving this, this kind of uh, um, terrain at the moment. It tend to be the best, uh, I hope. Maybe next time when I get here, I might see cubs of uh, 61 and 62 and uh, yeah, furthermore with all the leopards that in the surrounding. lovely it's unbelievable it's a nice a beautiful afternoon of course with the old elephant and i was like uh, this afternoon before we head out we were looking to head more to the towards the south but unfortunately we we're not able to reach the area i've seen a beautiful pythons on our way to that area we bumped to this elephant and decided to uh, follow them because you never know when it comes to a snake sometimes they can be active sometimes they can be far from the point where they've seen because in most cases there are some of them that are territorial they, they cover up to 20 square kilometer of an area which is huge you'll never ever predict where it might be so sometimes it's a lucky of draw if you come across with it on the road in the right time of course if not you spend even five years before to see a big python moving in. But what we'd like to see a daily basis is an elephant that is currently, you just look at the tree, look at the roads, tracks, and grass where there might be angled, and you follow up and able to find the elephant. Snakes tend to be difficult to find them, actually, because it's very small, and also it can be very, very easy, you know, on the grass itself, move here, you might not able to see them. We are in an area where it looks like it's a hub of all different animals. We are gonna try to head a little bit of Impala Plains, Zebra Clearing, if there's no wild dogs coming into the area or Ngachi Pride, because I really love the area at uh, late afternoon. But this time, 
we have seen quite a lot of them yesterday we had that lions were in the area the leopard we've seen and unfortunately all of them look like they headed back to the west the area is still wet not easy to follow up once they get into the certain area where ground is not uh, really dry up at the moment it tend to be not easy oh look at the fox here jungle it really enjoying the last kind of a light with an elephant using the elephant to disturb the insects then they can able to catch that unbelievable <coughs> oh lovely let's take this opportunity from this elephant light a fainting we're gonna leave and head to the west over to stiff with my ribs Thanks Rex, elephants in the fading light, your favourite leopard. Rexon's been here for a long time, he's known all the cats, intimately. As you've maybe only seen Rexon on the show recently, he's been a guide here at Juma for a long time. So when he says my favorite cat, he's got a lot to choose from. So, and Maribs was just here rolling in some elephant. It looks more like elephant urine than it was actually elephant dung, but uh, got very excited about it and rolled in it like it was catnip. Make sure you lick your ankles before you cross the water, Maribs. See how you navigate this little puddle. Are you going to jump? No, got to make sure the shoulder's clean. Now he is heading in a northerly direction. If he keeps up this route, which is what he's used to doing, he likes to come to our open areas there by camp. If he keeps going in this direction, he's going to pick up the smell of Columba's carcass. I'm certain of it. If he keeps going straight and then we're going to see an interesting interaction he is little brother so to speak but he's much bigger than her okay well if, before I lose him I'm gonna move up because as we all know these, these cats can just go off-road for a moment and they're gone I see him. I was blinded by the, the sun for a moment there. We also keep looking over our shoulder for the moon to your eyes. <laughs> and maybe if we're not in a leopard sighting, we might even howl. Maybe. <laughs> but apart from the effects the moon has with regards to light, I don't. I don't see the effects that it has on the animals, although our impala breeding is most certainly cued between two full moons. So there's definitely something that it does, but I, I can't tell you through my own experience witnessing other animals how the moon affects them. The light, no doubt, makes life a lot easier for them to see. Okay, he's going straight. I think he's been listening to the radio as well. Stations, we got Talamba up the tree now feeding on her carcass off of Philemon's cut line, which is just around the corner, probably about 500 meters from here. It does. It does. There was talk that we, we lost one on bushwalk years ago, and maybe Maribs finally found it. Maybe he finally found it. Okay. Well, if you were with me with Mawati the other day as well, this was the road that I kept losing him on till I eventually got behind him. Elephants are screaming over there. 
They're not going that way. They were in the road actually before, and he's waited for them to move off. Now he's having a look. He was having a look at the bush. And then he gave his shoulder a lick. Typical behavior of our cats. The wind is a little bit stronger where we are. I think depression there. But it's an interesting behavior because the wind is blowing from directly behind him. He's going more on experience for where he's had success in areas he likes to hang out in than with actual conditions because he wouldn't be smelling Lama's Kill right now. That's almost certain. definitely have areas they like to walk to fringes of areas suitable habitat which provides the suitable prey and in the case of Marips would be Deka Impala ground nesting birds puff adders they could be anywhere. Hopefully we don't see that again. Bubbling casinas bubbling behind me. Stuck in bed, I think once the scent marking starts, it's sort of that, here we're gonna, he's gonna do it again, is he? Once they start doing it, it's kind of like a shift in their behavior, and I don't think they turn it off. Um, it's kind of a, a, a trait that's benefited species, certain species. Holding the territory is, is beneficial to your breeding success, so it lends to be, tends to be a successful trait and then passed on secures food resource which secures mating rights so physiological changes start coming into him and he just suddenly starts getting interested in females he starts showing certain hormonal changes physical changes as well and then the need to urinate and rub his face on everything and that starts to happen no, about now with each individual it's slightly different exactly when just going to check in on the radio because we're not far from Tlalamba the Sabre Sabre for Steve Station and luck with the llama for Steve. Okay, so she's not there. Okay, well, maybe we will find both. Yeah, this radio is uh, playing up on me. Okay, so now I'm guessing we're in the region of 250 to 300 yards from the place where Tlalamba was last seen. So we'll keep following and see what unfolds.
Cape as you can see, we've got a beautiful sunset at the moment here at Medikwe. And uh, the sun has set now, so now this is the time to look out for any of the predators, of course, like things like lions, leopards, hyenas, jackal, they'll become definitely more active on or at this time of the evening. But I think we might have something very nice to show you because we have been searching around this area quite a bit. And uh, as you can see, we have got a quenna pride. Absolutely, I'm so happy to have him. Beautiful. Of course, we've got the three females and a young male that is lying out here in the open. So apparently they have been lying here for most of the day. And it's good just to kind of try and see if we can relocate. Three brothers, named the Avoka males, arrived in Juma in 2018. So this is our first good look at the Avoka males, so they're definitely a bit older than what I thought when we were looking at them. They're just under five. This area had recently been vacated by the Birmingham boys. The Avokas grabbed the opportunity and took over the Talamati and Nkohuma prides quickly. In 2019, they were seen mating with females from both prides and went on to sire cubs with them. We are very privileged to be watching the Nkohuma pride as the sun comes up. The most recognizable lion in this coalition is Dark Mane. Aside from the dark mane that gave him his name, he can be recognized by a distinctive limp. This limp stems from an injury to his right leg he sustained while taking down a buffalo with the Inkohuma pride. Beautiful, beautiful. Thanks for joining us. A lovely, lovely moon rising, uh, rising from the east. It's unbelievable if you look at this, a full moon today, what that means into area, of course. Full moon, it means uh, even all species that um, are really dana or nocturnal species or dana species, they can able to be active at night. It's such amazing. You tend to see that um, some like um, great acres and more except as tea and bog, they will continue feeding at night because they can able to see. In most cases, you know that more species that uh, are not, uh, day now at night, they tend to be like hiding, find an area where they can hide and make sure that uh, it's safe all the time. If a leopard likes to get into that area or a lion, have to really go hard and they can able to feel that that's something in that particular area in the thicket and able to dash and run away. Ms. T. and Bok, Ray Decker, you know that. Uh, not nocturnal species, only day now species. They can be active during the day, but today they have an extra a light that they can use or utilize in the course of a night, able to really feed and be free from anything that might be in the surrounding. You tend to see quite a lot of pride of lions this time of, of I mean, in the season of a moon or any time where we have moon, they tend to be not uh, active quite a lot. Wherever I have leopard, we'll take an example. If it's not in a kill or lion is not in a kill, they cannot hunt. Soon the light of a moon takes place. It's something that they know that they waste the energy. Unless in a pride where they have a lot more experience, they can hunt buffalo. Yes, they can do that. You know, buffalo, they can try to do that. But the ant antelope, of course, tend to be like uh, wasting your energy to go for them because they can see lions or leopard coming from far distances. I've been, uh, I mean, following lions and leopards in a course of a, a full moon. They tend to be very much disappointing because they lie down all the time. They move like 100 meters, lie down. But after dark, if it's no moon, you tend to see the lions go and able to make a kill very easy. We'll see you today if a wild dog doesn't come in the area. If they headed to straight to the north, I mean, east, they might come back because this kind of a moon here, it gives them a little bit of a light. They can always do extra mile. And they can be and at getting into the area where we are and able to see them. Let's see tomorrow morning. We might have a joy with the wild dogs or anything. I won't promise for lions because lions is their choice. They can move in the area where they think all the time they're safe and they're not going to really get other lions to 
interact and fight for territorial. So wild dogs are home range species, same as cheetah, home range species. Wherever they go, there is no fight at all. Unless if they come across with the same species of same gender or another wild dogs, they can fight for that rank within the females. It's very common in practice. The reason why they fight is all about that. But with wild dogs, you know that a alpha male and alpha male can really move from one pack to another if they want because of that rank they will be always respected it's not something that they have to fight for it if they decide to move from uh ottawa pack or send ottawa pack up to Ambali um, pack they can do that there's nothing can stop them it's such amazing beautiful Sometimes full moon, it can also From the moon, beautiful yellow moon, let us take uh, this opportunity back to Cedric with the lions. Well, we're in a very difficult area at the moment with this <coughs> signal wise, but um, yes, but these lines have not moved at all yet, so we're just going to be waiting a little bit longer just to take a look. But yes, I just want to say thank you to uh, certain individuals for the donations to Wild Earth, and of course that is uh, Dana Ferguson and uh, Natalie Carber. Thank you so, so much for the donations. We do really appreciate it. It helps us a lot. It helps wild earth and of course it goes to good causes thank you so much for the donations but yes i'm hoping that uh, these lines will donate some action for us tonight let's see you never know but at this point of time it seems like they are very very fast asleep and well we've got one or two heads are up but i'm hoping maybe they will get active a little bit later on As you know, that lions are pretty much, uh, especially as they're conserving energy at uh, during the daytime and using it mainly at night time. All right, we are going to switch over to infrared, so I do apologize. We're going to quickly just get the infrared on so we can view them at night. There we go. William, good afternoon, good evening, good morning, wherever you are watching from. Thank you so much for joining us on our Sunset Safari. Yes, definitely this uh, drive keeps on getting better and better and there's so much action. It's so nice that uh, they found my rips there in uh, Juma. Very nice to have that young male leopard as well around there. And especially that he's now just turned three years old, which I um, know, yeah, which is fantastic. But yes, as you can see, the one female has got a collar. So there is, of course, research on uh, the lions here at Madikwen and just making sure that they do keep tabs on them. So the one female, of course, the oldest of the four on the left hand side, she has got that collar around her neck. But it is a very large reserve. I mean, you're looking at about 80,000 hectares. So it's a size almost the same when uh, Sabi Sands, when Mala Mala and Sabi Sabi used to be part of the Sabi Sands. And uh, that was about 76,000 hectares. And of course. How's it going, Wild Earth? My name is Igor. I'm a camera operator for Penguin Beach. I've been a camera operator for almost 10 years now. What I love the most about working at Wild Earth is the amount of time that I get to spend in nature and observing animals in their natural environment. Not only that, but actually being able to see animals as they grow up. But when I'm not working on Wild Earth, what I love the most is to spend time in nature. I jump in the sea as often as I can. I take hikes. So I love being in the sea. I love being in the mountains. I love being in the desert. So I try and do that as much as I possibly can. 
The thing I love most about these African penguins is actually their character. If you look at the attitude that they actually have while going about their business, it is just the best thing. The questions I love getting the most from viewers are very thoughtful questions. Questions born out of genuine curiosity and a love and a passion for coastal wildlife. Well, everybody, we've to apologize for again losing you there for a moment. Broadcasting from these live locations has their difficulties, but we've pretty much walked straight past where Sabre is with Tlalamba, or at least with Tlalamba's kill. We're coming up this road that takes us up to the open area back towards camp, and he definitely had a whiff of a mo for a moment there, and then decided he's going to keep walking. fresh. Wonderful frog sounds. Hmm. A nice little saunter up the road with my ribs. Love the IR light and um, the full moon which Rexon has been showing you is beaming on our right hand side. Been thoroughly enjoying it. But the IR light is great because we can we can follow him without using lights, which is obviously first prize, but when you're on me like this it becomes difficult. I want to be able to see him, of course. But if he goes off into the bush, or if he suddenly looks like he's stalking something, it's nice to give everybody equal opportunity. Like now, we've lost him. Kenneth, there we go. You love following my ribs? Well, following him in there is not going to be ideal. <laughs> In the darkness, there it goes. This is pretty much exactly where Malwati took me the other day. Like father, like son, they say, don't they? Okay, well, just down the road, we can see her lights from here. Sabre is looking at Tlalumba's carcass. Let's go over to her. Yeah, we can see Steve too, and lucky for him, he can or did see a leopard. We, on the other hand, must have just missed Talamba. She's put her kill up into a tree, which is great, because we were all wondering why on earth had she not done it yet. She found it was high time and hoisted it in the very marula we thought she would. She's probably just lying off not too far from us, listening to me talking, blissfully unaware that we are looking for her and wishing she was up in the tree so we could have this incredible sighting of a leopard up in a tree with the beautiful full moon rising in the background. But alas, she seems to have other plans. I am wondering if she hasn't gone off into the drainage line that she keeps wandering off into since she's been at this carcass. It's probably exactly where she's gone off to. I'm also very surprised that Marebs didn't come to this carcass being so close by. But at least Steve did get a wonderful leopard fix this afternoon. Slightest bit of a breeze has picked up. 
very comfortable temperature at the moment. Every now and then I'm just shining the spotlights around us, seeing if there's any sign of her. Very unlikely she'll come back at this moment, considering it seems she was just here with her carcass. But we can be optimistic and hopeful that she does. Otherwise, at least she hasn't had the rest of her carcass pinched away. June bug, you are right to an extent that female leopards are better at climbing trees. More so that they are better at climbing smaller trees. And it's not necessarily because of skill, but more because of their weight. So a female leopard weighs quite a bit less than a male leopard. And that's going to enable them to go onto much smaller branches than what a male leopard can. Particularly a very big male leopard. Smaller branches are going to struggle to support his weight. So a, a female leopard in collisions of leopard sightings that I've seen, where a male leopard is after a female leopard, and the female leopards often go onto the thinner branches where the male leopard actually can't reach them without it becoming a little bit more dangerous. And much the same for leopard cubs. If they're trying to escape from lions or even another leopard, they can go onto the tiniest, most spindly branches. They're such incredible climbers from such a young age. And that's a perfect way for them to escape from another leopard if one happens to be in the same vicinity chasing them around. They can go onto those tiny little branches to escape them. So I wouldn't say it's too much to do with skill, but more to do with their weight. So so why leopards are one of the reasons why leopards are so good at climbing trees in comparison to lions is how their weight is distributed. Lions are more powerful, bulky creatures adapt for taking down bigger prey. Leopards are adapted to still be be large, but still small enough to be able to take their kills into the treetops. <laughs> Slumber has positioned this carcass quite funnily into this tree. Poor Impala looks like it's having a good rest. Please, nothing goes to waste out here. She's gonna eat most of it. Tony, that's so nice of you. Thank you so much. I'm really enjoying this drive too. So great to come back to my familiar old stomping grounds, much of it anyway. We never used to tra traverse in Juma, so it's great to see some new areas as well. It's been a really, really beautiful afternoon and that moon was simply the cherry on top. Such a beautiful, quiet night. Only natural sounds can be heard around us. Having a quick scout around us with the spotlight, making sure she's not popping out behind us. Puma, it does. <laughs> it does feel quite strange to not have guests on my vehicle. Keep looking behind me and no one's there except for BK. These BK's got a good smile. Makes it feel a lot better. But it's also really nice to just 
be able to enjoy and sit with what you want to sit with and enjoy. I feel like this drive is, feels more personal, which is really nice. The moon, the view of it this evening is so worthy. So I'm gonna pass you guys over to Steve so you can get a real good look at it. Well, I was about to give a howl there and then I realized I'd probably scare these in parlor. But uh, we lost my ribs on our way up the hill at last shot you had of us with him. He definitely just moved into the block and we thought, well, what better place to come and wait for him than with the moon in the sky and some vigilant impala. So some information I managed to scratch together for tonight's full moon, which is quite interesting. Don't mind me delving into a little bit. While uh, this is in Virgo, so it's opposing the sun in Pisces. Well, Pisces represents your intuition and your spirituality. Virgo represents your daily routine, physical health, your work and your external reality. Mm. Virgo thrives in the material world while Pisces exists in the world of spirit. And when a full moon takes place in Virgo, it sharpens the details of your reality and reveals what still needs cleaning, nurturing, organizing, and fixing. So as the last six months come to mind, the full moon in Virgo will serve as a checkpoint. Healthy habits, sustainable routines, and uh, possibly one's relationship with your work life. During the cycle, new opportunities can be amplified. Amplify your mental, emotional, and physical health. You may have popped up. Perhaps there was a new professional position. So you've been offered a healthier work environment. Some lifestyle changes coming your way. Some time to let go of any residual anxiety, criticism anything else that inhibits self-improvement during this full moon in Virgo. Now it's time to howl. Um, Olaf, are you going to join me? I'm only joking everybody. We're not going to howl right now. We'll scare the wildlife. It's just a little little mist on the moon there. There's no other moisture to be seen. It's just as a little hat. Almost angelic it seems. You can hear the scops owl calling behind me. Gregory, it's about their ability to see. So, I mean, I could, I could probably see an animal movement at 20 yards, maybe 30 in these conditions. So these animals have got much better visual capability in low light conditions than I do. And so I think they feel a lot more relaxed and a lot safer. Uh, if it's a full moon and the wind is blowing, I think that can affect them. But it seems to be quite a still evening. The impala will still hang out in large groups for safety, but I think they can breathe a sigh of relief 
when the moon is full because it's very hard to sneak up on them. Obviously, their behavior of moving out into the open, I'm talking about Impala here, moving out into the open like this is, is their saving grace because an animal has to cross a decent sized open patch to be able to catch them. But I don't think Impala or many of our prey animals are ever at total ease. They live in a constant state of alertness and awareness. I think it's wonderful lessons for us to learn. Complacency leads to their death. So they're never complacent. They're always very aware of what's going on. But definitely they seem a lot more relaxed now because the moon is shining and because there's no wind. So when any of their senses are impacted, there'll be a, a resultant negative sort of behavior pattern, be it anxiety, be it jitteriness. It doesn't prevent a pride of lion from stalking a herd of impala and setting a trap and then running towards them. There's nothing to stop that happening, but a, a lone lioness or a leopardess trying to sneak in here and catch one of these impala, difficult work if they don't run towards him or her. Well, so far this evening, I've only gotten about three insects in my eyes. It's not too bad as far as it can be. <laughs> the insects are enjoying the last of our summer and very happy after all the rain. So there is an abundance of them. And somehow, pretty much every night drive I go on, I always get an insect in my eye or more. And as often as it's recommended, I never do put on the safety goggles that stop it from happening. I feel like an insect would find its way into my eye anyway. Well, we've left Kill to Lumber, and now we're just cruising around, seeing if we can find any nightlife. Perhaps a chameleon clinging to a tree sleeping, more quick Janet crossing the road, we'll take what we get.
Yes, Sue, thank you for coming back to us here at Madikwe. And of course, we're still sitting with the Quena Pride. They are still just very much being a lazy around here this evening. Definitely not much movement. Morning, no stretching. It seems like about a, a rough 24 hours or something because there's definitely no movement. But there is so much lightning happening just behind us at the moment. Just in the, it seems like it's coming straight north. So I'm sure maybe these uh, lines will maybe head for cover not too long from now if this rain does come through. And I might just go and creep under one or two of these bushes around here. But you can just see a very, very lazy fall now. So it's nice to see them. That's one thing. As we saw, we got to see it today. What did he say? Day before. Oh, it was day before. And uh, they are absolutely beautiful um, lions. Yo, I mean, the, the two older females, oh, they got their head up. The two older females, of course, quite staunch, big bodies, big shoulders, definitely, definitely larger compared to the Sabi Sands lions. You know, I think maybe it's just because of the environment as well, and maybe the genetics and the gene pools where they're coming down from. But they are beautiful. And of course the two youngsters that's with these two females, of course they are the offspring of the Mayua males. So the Mayua males is a And uh, they're pretty much, they're quite far south from where we are now at the moment. Um, they had them calling around close to the airstrip. So that's maybe a good, say, four kilometers, five kilometers south from where we are now. And I had them calling there this morning, so but unfortunately nobody was able to locate on either one of those two beautiful male lions. But it just shows you now at night time we've got the infrared on. Now with lions they can see so well at night. Now you can see that black, that black comes out so nice it actually really pops out. And the same as the black tip pod my tails as well. each other and you wouldn't think black would be easy but for them that works way way better and uh, to see where each individual's location is sorry Mal I did not get Stuart's uh, question does uh, the full moon have anything to do with the lion sleeping no uh, not I think full moon, you'll find sometimes uh, that's what they'll do. If they patrol at night on full moon, they'll do like rather territorial than actually hunting because your diurnal animals can now see because of the moon. It's like a, it's like what you call it, a flashlight. Um, but without the full moon, suddenly you'll find that the lions will take uh, that advantage of the pitch, pitch and uh, they will try and see if they can up their prey species. So definitely your night time with no moon or focus for moon, you'll find that they will do more patrolling and send marking territory. But that, that lightning is... Uh, <laughs> uh, luckily we're going south and not north when we leave these lions because if we were going north and I think I would be sleeping in the car tonight. Wild Earth's mission is an expensive one, but we know that our live experience is important to so many people that cannot afford to pay for it. We have added a donate button to our website. By donating, you are directly helping us share our free nature experiences with the world. We want Wild Earth to reach children, budding conservationists, and the less fortunate. A little money goes a long way. You can make a difference to someone today.
He's just still bumbling around looking for any nocturnal activity. We're just Beaker and I were just saying we'd have to be very lucky to see something while we were live because it would be very hard to keep a view of it for you guys otherwise because a little trot off into the grass particularly the smaller creatures like genets and the white-tailed mongoose this grass is so long they would disappear almost instantly it's so good for the winter to come all the grazers are going to have lots of food Nina, I would love to see a civet right now. That would be a very cool nocturnal animal to end it off with. Quite unlikely, but it would still be really cool. Or a genet. I think more realistically, perhaps a chameleon or a genet. Two little scrub hairs. Here's something. Hopping off into the distance. Look like uh, two different sizes. So I wonder if the one is an older leveret. It's the name for a baby scrub hair. They're so independent, even from such a young age. They really don't need mum except for a little drink of milk here and there and then they're off doing their own thing again. Poof and off they go Jackie, just like a hare in any story. Quick on their feet. They do however have a better chance of surviving at night than they would in the day with all the aerial predators all the eagles and things that they'd have to worry about in the day and that's why they are nocturnal feeders scrub hares even though there are still many nocturnal predators they feel safer at night Jason, it's a quite a variable answer to that question. Herd animals like impalas and things like that, they might huddle up a bit closer together. Even lions on cool evenings, although they are predominantly nocturnal, can be quite static and then are also huddled together in a little pool of lions to keep nice and warm for the evening. Um, so if they are not a solitary animal that's how they'll keep warm in numbers and the more solitary animals leopards will get a bit more of a winter coat so their bodies are just amazingly adapted to it i don't think we could ever survive in the cold without any help from our blankets or heaters at night and in the mornings to get their body temperature back up they're gonna go and bask in the first rays of sunlight and that's you always see the animals really really enjoying that the squirrels you can just see how they melting into the light loving those first rays obviously they do get quite cold the thick thicker skinned animals doesn't worry them too much the cold but uh, some of the the smaller herbivores i'm sure they feel it but they manage Leopards and lions are also often seen on tar roads or on big rocks to keep warm because those, sub those substrates will hold the temperature a lot better. Anyway guys, we're going to pass you on to Steve. Continue looking for a chameleon.
Hmm. Well, Sabre, it's lovely to have you on Juma. We used to cross paths a few times in the east. Oh, we thought we would just close off this evening safari with some more views of this wonderful moon. Also have the opportunity to listen for those impalas to alarm call. Maybe a last minute leopard. So splendid to find my ribs today. Happy that Tlalamba has hoisted her kill finally. Get some good views there tomorrow morning. So just to conclude on the moon story this evening and the full moon in Virgo we have the, have the opportunity to uncover shadows around perfectionism about feeling good enough and accepting ourselves as we are in each moment when Virgo meets the full moon on March the 7th 2023 which is today everybody it's time to release our fear of making a mistake and instead take a leap of faith. Beautiful sentiments to, to hold on to when we are coming to the end of the astrological year. Aries is upon us. Those beautiful fiery Aries people out there coming into your own soon. Uh, tomorrow morning you will be joined by Ali and Saber out on safari here in Juma. International Women's Day. Nadia, it's been a wonderful afternoon. We thank you for joining us. We were glad we could find The Little Prince. <laughs> I read that book recently, The Little Prince. Very cute. The elephant inside the boa constrictor. Some of you might have no clue what I'm talking about. Very cute little book. Hmm, well, what a wonderful evening. Full moon in Virgo, we just love spending time with the sun that just gets brighter and brighter over my shoulder, but that's okay. Back over to the moon as uh, it climbs higher and higher into this beautiful marula tree. Only a few moisture grains of clouds to be seen in the sky add some beautiful coloration and everybody thank you for joining us this afternoon on the sunset so far as we wonderful showing you about we do look forward to seeing you again i'm going to be off tomorrow as it's international women's day we'll let the ladies take over and but we do thank you for your questions and comments and we'll see you tomorrow morning same time same place until then good night and goodbye <laughs>